Good morning, everybody. I welcome you all for the ninth ASU Professor H.S. Bat midterm workshop organized by Association of Southern Urologists. It's my proud privilege to invite the dignitaries for this virtual conference. Dr. N. Malikarjun Reddy, President ASU, Dr. M. Ganesh Kamat, Organizing Chairman and Immediate Past President of ASU, Dr. G. Chengalvarayan, Honorary Secretary ASU, Dr. C. Malikarjuna, President, Urological Society of India, Dr. Keshav Murthy, Secretary, Urological Society of India, Dr. P. Venugopal, Senior Most Urologist and Student of Professor H. S. Bhatt, Dr. Sanjay Bhatt, Proud Son of Professor H. S. Bhatt. Let me also join the event. Now I invite Dr. Ganesh Kamath, organizing chairman for this event, to deliver his welcome address. Good morning, friends. It's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of ASU to this premier event of our Zoom, the ninth ASU Professor H. S. Butt midterm workshop. As per the original ASU calendar, we should have been in Trichy for this meeting. Unfortunately, continuing uncertainty of pandemic restrictions forced us to take two decisions. First, to conduct it in a virtual format, and second, to organize it by the ASU Council itself. These uh, decisions were taken as late as August in the GBM, giving us just about three months to prepare. I'm happy we were able to chalk out a program which hopefully has all the ingredients which make this midterm event unique. Clinically relevant topics centered around a theme with gray areas deserving debate. And what's special this year, we have two invited talks from academic stalwarts in their respective fields who will rivet our attention. The only thing we will sorely miss in this format is the active floor discussion, which is difficult and if I may say so, well nigh impossible to replicate on a virtual platform. I thank the faculty for sparing their effort, time and energy, my fellow members of the scientific committee for curating this program and you, the audience, for participating in what promises to be a well-spent Sunday morning. Thank you. Professor Hatangadi Shashidar Bhatt, popularly known as Professor H.S. Bhatt, was born in a simple family in Udupi on 21st of January, 1921. After his early school education in Mangalore, he went on to complete his undergraduate medical studies from Stanley Medical College, Chennai in 1945. He was the best student in his batch and showed a keen interest in surgery even in his early days. He joined CMC Vellur in 1946 and worked in various departments and later completed his Master's in General Surgery in 1953. HSB was a man who believed that to become a successful consultant, one needs God's grace and accurate understanding of the fundamentals and basic principles of surgical techniques. An academician of outstanding repute, HSB has won nine gold medals and is the winner of the prestigious Dr. Basie Roy Award. As chairman of special committees of Indian Council of Medical Research and as a member of the academic committees of several universities, professor has devised and updated courses for students in urology. HSB organized the first Urological Society of India meet in Vellu in 1961. He had the honor of being the president of the Urological Society of India during 1970-71. He has also served in the Council of the National Academy of Medical Sciences of India and has been a member of the editorial board of the Indian Journal of Urology. HSB worked as honorary professor in Bangalore Medical College for a brief period. He also worked at St. Philomena Hospital in Bangalore before he joined Puttaparthi in 1990-91, where he was the chairman of the Department of Euronephrology which is recognized for his training DNB students in urology. The late Dr. Prema Bhatt, wife of HSB, was a renowned microbiologist who had done a pioneering work in the field of urinary tuberculosis for ICMR. The couple is blessed with four children, Dr. Usha, a clinical pathologist, Dr. Tara, a microbiologist, Gurudath, engineer, and Dr. Sanjay Bhatt, 
urologist. Professor HSB left for his heavenly abode on 19th November 2010. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Para Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha, Tasmai Shri Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Good morning everyone. It's a privilege to welcome you all to the 9th ASU Professor H.S. Bhatt Midterm CME. It's a singular honor to be a part of this sentinel, part of this on the sentinel year of birth of Professor H.S.B which is 21-1-1921 and today is 21-11-2021. Not everyone has the opportunity to deliver the presidential address on the 100th year of Professor HSP. We all know that the concept of the CME is theme-based. This year, the theme is on UTI. The Secretary, Dr. Surya Prakash, has put up a wonderful comprehensive scientific program. We also have a mix of the faculties from ID and radiology to augment our understanding of this subject. UTI has been the most neglected, least understood and thoroughly mismanaged disease. It has many facets and the recent COVID has brought a new dimension to it. The treatment paradigms have changed. I sincerely believe that the CMV will give you an outline to increase your understanding of the disease and lay the foundation to improve our knowledge and thus deliver good treatment to our patients. I once again say that it's been a privilege uh, to be a part of the CME and I thank ASU for this opportunity to deliver the presidential address on the centenary year of Professor HSB. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. The, the ASU Professor HSB Midterm Workshop has been a very important academic program for Association of Southern Urologists. This workshop is held every year to commemorate Professor HSB, the father of Indian urology, who left for heavenly abode on 19th November 2010. Every year, a topic of interest to all the urologists is discussed in detail. The first workshop was held in 2013 in Chennai on controversies in urology. Due to the COVID pandemic, the 2020 workshop was held in a virtual format on male non urogenic class. This year's workshop is organized by the ASU Executive Council again in a virtual format. The theme for this year is urinary tract infections, a bugging dilemma. This is one disease which we deal with every day in our practice and are yet puzzled sometimes as how to diagnose and treat these patients. Moreover, antibiotic misuse is alarming and has led to the emergence of resistant organisms to many broad spectrum antibiotics. To put it in Professor HSP's words, I quote from his book titled, Take Our Hands Swami. Let us give antibiotic and see seems to be today's trend. This has to be condemned outright. It is not a good idea to shoot and then see what one has shot. It should rather be the aim to see and shoot, lest one waste a bullet on a wrong target. I unquote. The scientific committee headed by Dr. Ganesh Kamath has put all the efforts to make the program informative and interesting. Today's workshop is divided into four sessions. The first is on the diagnosis of UTI, where we have talks on basic urine culture methods to the advanced next generation sequencing. The second session is on microbial factors. In the third session, we have interesting debates. The last session is on host factors and urosepsis with a guest lecture and interesting case scenarios discussed by expert panelists. I hope all of you will relish today's academic feast. Thank you.
Let me thank the ASC Council for giving me this opportunity to be with you all on this occasion of the ninth HSB program today. My association will join fight over five decades. If what I am today, it is because of his generosity of nurturing me and guiding me at every step of my life. Today's program is based on UTA urinary tract infections. During my formative years, we had hardly any antimicrobials and we had to depend mostly on chloramphenicol that was used at that time. Numerous advances have taken place since then. And today we have a plethora of antimicrobials at our disposal. Antimicrobials are essential, but they also cause harm to the human body. Most of the important thing is today, our advances are taking place towards non-antimicrobials usage in urinary tract infection. The most important aspect in this also is the use of vaccines and understanding of urinary microbiota. I'm sure this program will enrich all of us in understanding the current concepts and aspects of urinary tract infection. I once again thank the organizers, ASU Council, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Good morning. On behalf of the Association of Southern Urologists, I would thank our president, Dr. Malikarjun Reddy, for presiding over this function. I would also thank our organizing chairman, Dr. Ganesh Kamat, and our organizing secretary, Dr. Surya Prakash, and the entire team of the scientific committee who designed a wonderful program for us. We are also grateful to have Prof. P. Venukopal for his blessings today. And we are also happy and proud to have Dr. C. Malikarjuna, the president of the USI. Dr. R. Keshav Murthy, the Secretary of the USI, and Dr. Sanjay Bhatt, the proud son of Professor H. S. Bhatt, along with us in the inaugural function. We are extremely th thankful to all the speakers, chairpersons, and the panelists who are going to take us into the deepest insights into the clinical aspects of urinary tract infection. We thank the senior urologists, our dear colleagues, and postgraduates who are attending this program who are going to be the maximum beneficiaries. We also thank our computer associates. Serial technologies for their good support and the expected flawless transmission. Thank you. Vinna Himachala Yamuna Dhamma Utsala Janadhita Nanda Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Ashish Mange Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jan Gana Mangal Dayat Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidata Jaya He Uh, uh, without wasting any time, we move on to the academic session. Now we start with the first session. Uh, that is the diagnosis of UTI. Uh, for this session, I invite the chairpersons, Dr. G.G. Lakshman Prabhu, Dr. Prasad Shiramattam, Dr. Ellen Dorai Rajan, and Dr. Jagdish Tirukovila. So now I, ha I hand over the session to the chairpersons to conduct the session. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Without wasting much time, I would request the first speaker to get started and uh, request my co-moderators to take us through the session. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning all. Uh, it's a real privilege to be the opening batsman in this prestigious HSBAT uh, midterm workshop with urinary tract infection as the theme. 
Uh, one of the most cl common clinical conditions we uh, face in our day-to-day -day practice is uh, urinary tract infection and the backbone of diagnosis of any urinary tract infection is a urine culture. And uh, we'll be covering these topics today. Uh, the specimen management uh, is one of the most uh, key to the accurate uh, lab diagnosis because it influences the therapeutic uh, decisions and also it influences the antibiotic stewardship. Appropriate uh, specimen collection is one of the most uh, crucial part in the diagnosis of uh, uh, the urinary tract infection and uh, swabs are generally poor specimens. The specimens collected should be transported to the lab within two hours of collection and it should be done in a sealable leak proof uh, container. Um, and ideally it has to be done uh, within two hours and only if there is a delay uh, which is expected it has to be uh, refrigerated or uh, preservatives such as boric acid should be used. Uh, labeling is, uh, is extremely important and it should be uh, meticulously done and it should include all the uh, information about the patient uh, and then it has to match with the requisition form. The requisition form is the order form that is sent to the lab along with the specimen and it has to contain all the information regarding the patient, the history, diagnosis and the immunity status and the usage of antibiotics. The containers which are used for specimen collections are usually disposable glass or plastic containers and has to be uh, the, the seal has to be strong entirely secure so that the sample does not leak or gets contaminated the midstream urine sample or catheterized urine sample suprabubic aspirates are commonly used for uh, specimen collection midstream urine sample is easier done in the male but in females it has to be done a little more carefully to avoid any uh, contamination of the specimen um, the labia has to be uh, held apart during voiding and then the midstream urine sample has to be collected catheterized urine sample only if it is not possible to get an adequate midstream urine sample because this is much more invasive it requires a health personnel and um, there is a chance for hydrogenic uti uh, if there is an indwelling catheter it has to be collected after clamping the catheter from and then aspirated from the catheter and never from the catheter bag Catheter tips are not uh, appropriate specimen as they are contaminated. Suprabubic aspiration can be done uh, in prior neonates and small children with the bladder full and after cleaning the skin with 70% isopropyl alcohol. In children, a collection bag can be used, but then there's a high chance it of being a contaminated specimen. But a negative culture in these cases can definitely rule out a UTI. Different other techniques uh, in, 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 clean, in different clinical situations like in uh, PCN aspirates or cystoscopy specimens or ileal conduit specimens can be used uh, by after taking appropriate precautions. In tuberculosis, early morning, three samples on consecutive days are collected. Uh, in different clinical scenarios like urethritis, prostatitis, the clamping techniques has to be modified. Transport, as I said earlier, it has to be done as soon as possible within two hours. And uh, if there is a delay, refrigeration or preservative should be used. Once the specimen is received in the laboratory, the microbiologist, after overnight in incub incubation, the number of colonies um, are counted manually on each plate, usually blood agar or specialized agars like McConkey's, and then multiply the number of colonies counted by 100 if it's an undiluted urine or 10,000 if it's a 1 is to 100 dilution. Usually undiluted urine is used and is multiplied by 100. So uh, this gives a total number of viable bacteria in 1 ml of undiluted urine and expresses colony forming units per ml in 1 ml of urine. Accordingly, uh, if it's greater than 1 lakh colony forming units, we consider it as significant bacteriuria. Uh, for, but, for, but for SPC, PCN and cystoscopic specimen, any colony forming uh, units is significant. These are the possible results which are usually seen. Uh, we'll just check each one of them. If the culture is sterile, no growth, it's good. No demonstrable UTI. The only chance it could be a static bacterium when the sample is collected if the patient is on antibiotics. Scanty mixed urethral flora is, uh, doesn't show any demonstrable UTI. Uh, if it's a mixed urethral flora, it could be because of improper collection, transportation or due to improper preservation. Uh, in, in catheterized specimen, this type of reports can be seen when they choose multiple uh, bacteria, which could be pathogenic or colonizers, which has to be clinically correlated. If, if it's significant, a repeat culture has to be done after the change of catheters. Contaminated samples should not be uh, entertained and a repeat culture has to be done. This is the most dreaded report which we see, uh, bacteria with more than one lakh colony forming units, which is significant. And then uh, antibiotic susceptibility test is done on these 
uh, bacteria and the trend is prepared. This trend can vary between countries, states, districts, hospitals, even between patient subtypes. Based on the, uh, uh, the antibiotic susceptibility, an antibiogram is prepared. We have a, a, a picture perfect antibiogram, which is used as a reference, and then a national antibiogram. Uh, this is a perfect antibiogram where uh, gram negative bacteria and gram positive bacteria, and then the use of unrestricted antibiotics and the restricted antibiotics are pooled, and then the antibiogram is preferred, prepared. Uh, the more of green shows the much more susceptible, the more of reds show the bacteria is uh, becoming less susceptible, which is not a good picture. We should have more of green. Also, we have a national antibiogram uh, based on the common bacteria, uh, which are commonly seen, and then the restricted and the unrestricted antibiotics. This gives a, a general guideline for us to start an empirical antibiotic, and each hospital should have an antibiogram so that an empirical antibiotic can be started on these. Also, it helps to prevent drug uh, resistance. Now, uh, the main hindrance to the start of uh, 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 antibiotics in uh, urinary tract infection is the, uh, the delay in getting the uh, culture report, which takes usually 48 hours minimum with the current settings, because it needs a screening, then pathogen identification with different techniques, and then the antibiotic susceptibility test. There are some newer technologies which are coming in, like the lateral flow immunoassay, point of care uh, testing rapid and much more specific sensitive, then a combination of uh, Biosensors with microfluidics can be used. This helps in getting a much quicker report in less than 24 hours so that uh, the antibiotic therapy can be tailored and started at the earliest as compared to the present technology which is available. Thank you. So good morning. I thank ASU for giving me opportunity to present on this topic. Any patients on the catheter of more than 30 days is called a long-term catheter. So where do we use these long-term tubes? Mainly it is indicated in the patients with an, a selected surgical procedures or if the patients are critically ill patients or if the patients are incontinent or if the patients are majority of them are immobile due to a trauma or surgery. So what happens after putting this catheter? There are two factors. One is colonization where these microns produce an enormous amount of an, uh, proteins and other substances which are sticky in nature and which facilitate the formation of an, uh, biofilms. Whereas the other aspect is a bacteria. The incidence of bacteria is almost 3 to 7% in a day and slowly but the end of a month it is almost 100%. So, urine culture shivership is a multifaceted approach and you should perform only when appropriate indications are present in order to determine if the treatment with an antibiotics is indicated and it should be collected, stored and processed in a proper manner. And appropriate uses of urine cultures are mainly indicated if the patient comes to us with an, any urine tract infection, with any symptoms of any flank pain, renal angle tenderness or if the patient has got any amateuria or new onset of discomfort or if the patient has got any worsening of the sepsis, fever or any altered mental status without evidence of any other source of history or physical examination or in lab testing. And if the patient with any spinal cord injury patient, if you're able to find any increased spasticity, autonomic dyspraxia, or any sense of uneasiness, appropriate urine culture should be done. And basically it is not indicated if the patient comes to us with any odorous, cloudy or discolored or any pyuria. So the screening for and treatment of catheter associated asymptomatic bacteria in a catheterized patient to reduce catheter acid UTI, it usually it is not recommended in a patient like short term or long term invading the catheters, or even in a neurogenic bladder patients with an intermittent catheterization. And even if it is mainly indicated if the patient is in a pregnant woman or if the patient undergoing any surgical procedures. So the differentiating between this corti and catheter associated asymptomatic bacteria, mainly on the microbiology process, if the colony is showing anything more than 10 of 3, that is considered as a corti, whereas in a, if they're more than 10 of 5, in a single even uh, species, it will be in the asymptomatic bacteria. Uh, pyuria alone is not a diagnostic and other elements are required. So the key components for urine culture protocol is the collection of a urine specimen. Any symptomatic patient before starting an antibiotic, the urine culture should be done. And the collection procedure in a catheterized patient depends on if the catheter is in a place of any patients more than 14 days, always try to replace the old catheter when they, and try to put a new catheter in a closed system. You have to collect the 
urine. Whereas if the patient is less than 14 days, always try to collect the uh, specimen by clamping the catheter three inches from the catheter site and with an aseptic precaution, try to aspirate. Or if the port is there, you can correct it directly. Whereas in the nephrostomy tube, try to disconnect the connector from the proximal and with an again aseptic precaution, you have to collect the specimen, at least 10 ml of urine is collected directly. So for this 10 ml, you have to sometimes wait for the urine. So when you should take it, take it seriously if the culture are positive. Majority of the patients, if you do, if the patient is asymptomatic, if they are showing any cons organism, microcochlear, diphtheroids, even the pseudomonas or klebsiella, they will have an enormous amount of colony. But if the patient is asymptomatic, we are not taking it as any significant. When you take it seriously, even if a single count of Staphylococcus aureus, it should be considered as any significant. Whereas the candida species, again, you have to repeat the sample and you always try to, if possible, if the patient is symptomatic, then you have to ask even the blood culture to compare with that. So there was a study conducted by an Agule and Evesi where they have shown that the patient on the nephrostomy tube, there was an a most common organ that they are able to see was an Eclepsiella pseudomonas E. coli, but they able to find that always the PCN yields in a better treatment to put on antibiotic than in a urine culture, urethral urine culture. So what are the precautions you can do and prevention strategies to consider? One, you can close catheter system can be used. You can use a prophylaxis with the systemic antimicrobials or enhanced meatal care. If you require a catheter irrigation can be given and routine catheter change always try to do with a prophylactic antibiotics at the time of catheter removal or even replacement. So always try to follow the six C's of a catheter associated unit tract reduction. That is consider any alternative is there or not. Second, you have to connect with a securement device. Third, you always keep it clean. Fourth, always call for a bladder scan before irrigating to look for any associated is there or not. And all fifth one is gonna keep it closed and always culture urine only when indication is clear. So I'd like to conclude in long-term indwelling catheter, colonization is inevitable. Urine culture should be indicated only in asymptomatic patients and indications for urine culture is subjective and hospitals should use multifaceted approach. Pyuria and duration of catheterization are not to be considered and take always from a newly changed catheters and always try to follow six C's for prevention of COTI. Thank you. The next topic on this uh, special situation is uh, uh, urine culture in children. And I invite uh, Dr. Banu Teja from Hyderabad to deliver his uh, topic. Good morning, everyone. Greetings from Hyderabad. First of all, I would like to thank the South Zone uh, President, Dr. Malikarjan Reddy, sir, uh, Secretary Dr. Chengalayan, sir, and uh, Secretary elect Dr. Surya Prakash, sir for giving me this opportunity to present in this uh, prestigious Professor H. H. S. Butt uh, midterm conference and uh, greetings to the chairpersons. So today I'll, I'm going to speak about urine collection methods for culture in children. There are six common methods. The invasive techniques include urethral catheterization and suprapubic aspiration. Non-invasive techniques are clean catch void, stimulation voiding, urine collection bags and collection pads. Let's see one after the other. Urethral catheterization technique, I'm not going into detail as everyone is well versed. The urine obtained through this technique has a sensitivity of 95% and specificity of 99%. The contraindications are male children with moderate to severe phimosis, female child with tight labial adhesions, and those who had known trauma to the urethra. Suprapubic aspiration is considered gold standard because there is minimal likelihood of contamination avoiding bacteria from the distal urethra. So the technique, the child's suprapubic area is cleaned with betadine solution, then a whole towel is applied and using a sterile syringe and a 26 gauge needle, one centimeter above the pubic symphysis, we aspirate the urine sample and then send it for culture in a sterile urine container. It is most invasive and painful method uh, it is especially indicated in non-toilet trained children. Direct aspiration has uh, success rates of around 46 to 64%, whereas with ultrasound guidance, the success rate improved to 79 to 90%. The specific indications of suprapubic aspiration are frequent diarrheal stools, male child with moderate to severe phimosis, female child with tight labial adhesions. 
Contraindications are those who have empty or a non-palpable bladder, who have just urinated prior to procedure, and who have abdominal scars or wounds. Clean catch void. In this technique, the child's genitalia is cleaned with a sterile uh, betadine solution, and then the suprapubic area is stimulated with a cold gauze, and then the sample is collected in a sterile container, uh, keeping it in front of the child. Make sure that the container doesn't touch the perineal area or the skin of the child. So the disadvantages with this technique are high rates of contamination. Parents who collect the sample usually find the procedure messy and time consuming, and they are more likely to contaminate the container. So stimulation voiding is another technique which helps to achieve samples in timely manner and allows less time for contamination to occur. In this, the child is held upright with the legs dangling and then the suprapubic area is tapped at 100 taps per minute for 30 seconds, followed by circular lumbosacral massage for 30 seconds, alternating for up to 5 minutes. This helps to promote voiding, especially in children, after 30 minutes of feeding. So another technique is the urine collection bag. I'll show a small video of the collection technique. The child's genitalia is cleaned with the betadine solution. Then the, this is the urine collection bag, which is available in India. Uh, it has a peel-off sticker where the peel-off sticker is removed. And then the collection bag is applied onto the child's genitalia. Make sure that the, it is stuck all around the genitalia so that there is no sample loss. So the disadvantages of this technique are there are significant rates of contamination. And the positive culture from the specimen obtained through collection bag has a false positive rate of around 88%. So collection pads, this is a Newcastle urine collection pad kit which is available. Uh, so for the technique, I'll just show a small video. So uh, the child's diaper, these uh, collection pads or the absorbent material is placed and then the diaper is put onto the child. Then after an uh, hour or so, these uh, absorbent materials with the urine soaked are placed into the syringe, sterile syringe, and then the sterile urine container is taken and then the sample is squeezed into the urine container and sent for the lab. So the advantages of this technique are timely specimen collection, less trauma to the child, increased parental satisfaction. Disadvantages are high rates of contamination and they are contraindicated in children with diaper rashes. So to summarize, especially the contamination rates range from 25 to 60% in non-invasive methods. For invasive methods, urethral catheterization, the contamination rates are around 10%. For suprapubic aspiration, they are around 1%, making it the gold standard technique. Thank you very much. Next speakers. Next speaker is Dr. Harris Paul of Trishur. You would speak on pre-operative urine culture. Pre-operative urine cultures are conventionally considered before any major procedures to reduce the incidence of post-operative surgical site infection and post-operative urinary tract infection. But is it really helpful? So let us see whether the pre-operative cultures are essential or not. As you can see, asymptomatic bacteria is associated with the post-operative adverse effects like a surgical site infection and urinary tract infection. And the commonest hypothesis is being the bacterial translocation from the bladder to the resultant site which contaminates the surgical sites. So preoperative screening cultures are the conventional wisdom to prevent such a uh, post-operative complications. But is it really helpful? We have no doubt as to asymptomatic patients has to consider a preoperative culture and to treat a, cult, uh, treat a culture with the proper antibiotics before any planned procedure. But here we are talking about a totally asymptomatic patient who is going for a major procedure. So for the purpose of the study, we can divide this into non-urological procedures and urological procedures. Again, in urological procedures can make it with a foreign body like a catheter or a stent or without a foreign body. So non-neurological procedures, we have a large study from the Veterans Hospital in the um, US where they have studied a large cohort of patients with a preoperative urine culture 
where they are going for a major non-neurological procedures. And they found out that the uh, asymptomatic bacterial rate is extremely rare, around 4.3 percentage. But uh, when you have an asymptomatic bacteria, the positive urine culture results in the postoperative period is high. And there is a contradictory finding in which uh, even if you treat such patients with an antimicrobial therapy, there is no reduction in the incidence of postoperative surgical site infection or urinary tract infection. So they uh, formulated that the asymptomatic bacteria is a marker of host immunity and it shows a colonization. And these bacteria are the not the actual causative bacteria of the postoperative infection. So this particular study definitely uh, proves that there is no role for a preoperative urine culture and sensitivity and it should be discontinued in a non-neurological setting. Now, urological procedures broadly divided into with a foreign body like a catheter or a uretric stent or without. So without a foreign body, a patient who is undergoing a major endurological procedures like a uretroscopy, flexible versus rigid and a percutaneous nephrolithotropsy without any foreign bodies like a catheter or a stent. So we have a study from Massachusetts Hospital in Boston in which they have studied about 160 patients undergoing a major endurological procedures like URS or a PCNL. And they found out that the preoperative urine culture and sensitivity actually did not alter the outcome of the postoperative patients. But there is a contradictory uh, uh, guidelines from the European Association in which they said that all patients who are undergoing a major endurological procedure should have a preoperative urine culture and sensitivity and it should be uh, treated if there is a positive cultures. So it is difficult to reach a consensus as to whether to consider a preoperative urine culture and sensitivity in an asymptomatic patient who is going for a major endurological procedure. One interesting finding here is even if uh, the bacterial culture is positive, when you go for a stone culture and a pelvic urine culture in the postoperative period, there is a difference in the bacterial strain altogether. So even if you find a positive culture and a treat such culture, that may not cause uh, any benefit in the postoperative settings. And most of these procedures are done as a preoperative uh, uh, emergency procedure. So a microscopy may be a better than a, a urine culture or probably as good as urine culture and sensitivity. So uh, with foreign body, we have no doubt as to uh, there is a higher incidence of postoperative urinary tract infection uh, uh, in patients with a stent and a catheter. And one interesting finding would be the biofilm formation in such patients may give a negative preoperative urine culture. But the general consensus is to consider a preoperative urine culture uh, in all patients with a foreign body like a catheter or a stent. So the take home message would be a preoperative urine culture and sensitivity is not indicated in a major non-neurological procedures. A preoperative urine microscopy may be easier than culture in a urological procedures without a stent or a catheter. Preoperative culture is highly recommended for patients uh, with a catheter or a stent. And the ideal timing uh, of this preoperative culture would be about 10 days before the planned procedure so that we can treat it just in case if there is an infection. Thank you. The next speaker is our organizing secretary, Dr. Suira Prakash. He would speak on future in lab diagnosis. Dr. Suira Prakash. Good morning, everybody, respected chairpersons, teachers, seniors, and my dear friends. Uh, I'll be talking on what is in the future in the lab diagnosis of urinary tract infections. So the outline of my talk will be on the limitations of existing methods, novel methods and their clinical applications and the limitations of the novel methods. We all know that the standard urine culture takes time. It takes 48 to 72 hours to get a culture report and it is susceptible to contamination. So whenever we find low colony forming units and growth of several bacterial species, contamination has to be sus suspected. And there is also inconsistency in the th threshold definition of clinically significant UTI. Nearly 20 to 40 percent of the women with symptomatic UTIs present with bacterial counts of anywhere between 10 to the power of 2 to 10 to the power of 4 instead of standard 10 to the power of 5 colony forming units. 
Moreover, bacterial biofilms are not detected by standard culture methods. So in the current practice, uh, the back urine is initially screened by dipstick or microscopy, which is followed by the standard uh, urinary culture and sensitivity testing. But there are so many up upcoming new technologies wherein the urine is initially screened by point of care tests like lateral flow immunoassay, rapid optical screening, PCR, which is followed by comprehensive testing like integrated biosensor cartridge pathogen identification, multiplex PCR, and next generation sequencing, which will help in individualized tailored antibiotic therapy, thereby improved antimicrobial stewardship. So I'll be talking about these new technologies. So coming to the screening assays, the first among them is a lateral flow immunoassay. In this two monoclonal antibodies are used, one specific for enterobacteriaceae and other a broad spectrum antibody against gram negative and several gram positive species. It has got a very high, high sensitivity and specificity for samples with more than 10 to the power of 5 colony forming units. Flow cytometry is another screening test which detects pathogens in the urine by light scattering. It can detect most bacterial species as well as fungi. It is a good system for selecting samples for further analysis. The another screening test is the fluorescence institute hybridization. Fish assays are based on microscopic detection of fluorescently labeled nucleic acid probes that are hybridized to complementary targets. A common target for the detection of bacteria by nucleic acid hybridization is 16S rRNA. The rapid fish assays can be processed in 20 minutes with a sensitivity and specificity of over 96%. Though it's a powerful tool for detection of pathogens, fish is limited by inability to incorporate antibiotic sensitivity analysis. So the next one is ENOS. So ENOS or electronic noses, the mimic olfactory system and detect specific volatile organic compounds produced by the bacteria. The ENOS is a handheld system. It uses ion mobility spectrometry to assess VOC profile in 15 minutes. So after the screening test, next we go on to the culture methods. These are newer culture methods like enhanced culture for atypical organisms, which are done whenever we suspect atypical organisms like fungi, tuberculosis, bacilli, and rubic bacteria. For example, for tuberculosis, we use the newer methods like radiometric culture or bacteric culture. For anaerobic bacteria, we use anaerobic media. And whenever we suspect urea plasma or mycoplasma, the urine is inoculated on A7 agar, which detects the presence of ureas, thus allowing differentiation of urea plasma from mycoplasma tails. The other newer culture method is the expanded quantitative urine culture. It detects live microorganisms in urine specimens that are not detected by standard protocol. So how EQVC differs from standard culture? In this, the large volume of urine is inoculated to the tune of 100 ml. Multiple growth media are used for longer incubation times at different atmospheric conditions. So in EQVC, bacterial count as low as 10 colony forming units can be detected. In the streamlined version, 100 ml of urine is inoculated on McConkey, blood, and cholestinalidic acid agars in a 5% carbon dioxide incubator for 48 hours. So in this slide, you can see on the left side, the standard urine culture, the urine inoculated on it has not grown any organism, whereas the same urine inoculated on the EQVC has grown multiple organisms. So this urine is not sterile. So coming to the next test, that is the polymerase chain reaction. The multiplex PCR utilizes multiple primers to detect multiple targets at once. It is highly sensitive and specific. The results are obtained faster and it allows improved detection of polymicrobial infections. SEPTIFAST is one such real-time PCR from Roshi. It detects multiple panel targets, both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria and a number of fungal species. The SEPTIFAST identification of bacteria is possible at least 40 hours before the standard culture results. Uh, the limitations of PCR are the, in the current PCR assays provide only qualitative data indicating the presence of bacteria and not their concentration. PCR can provide information regarding the antimicrobial resistant genes, but it cannot provide comprehensive or definitive phenotopic information about antibiotic susceptibility. So the next newer technical technology is the next generation sequencing. NGS is a game changer in the diagnosis of UTI. The Human Microbiome Project has shown that urine of healthy people is not sterile. The bladder urine contains many microbes the, called urinary microbiome. Uh, the common among them are lactobacillus, cardinella, streptococcus, staphylococcus, and coronibacterium. Any small change in the healthy urinary microbiome can lead to overgrowth of harmful pathogenic bacteria. Thus, NGS can detect urinary pathogenic microbes, which cannot be cultured by the standard methods. 
So in NGS, uh, the, the technology utilizes the PCR and high throughput sequencing of the 16S rRNA of the bacteria. The presence of organism is reported, reported as the proportion relative to others, but not as absolute count. The Microgen DX and the Epiomics are the two companies which offer NGS as a clinical application for the diagnosis of UTIs. So the technology goes like this. The isolated 16S rRNA of the bacteria are subjected to bridge amplification. The amplified uh, genes are sequenced by the synthesis with reversible terminators. So here, here is an example of the uh, uh, comparison of traditional culture report with the next generation sequencing. On the left side, you can see the traditional culture report, which has grown the E. coli and the colony count is 10,000 to 25,000. But at the same sample, when subjected to next generation sequencing, we can see on the right hand side, it has grown five different types of bacteria of which, of which E. coli contributed only 4%, whereas the leptotrichia ammoni uh, amounted to 48%. It can also show the fungal species if present and also the resistance genes for the various bacteria. Though it's a new technology, it has got some limitations. NGS, in NGS, the presence of organisms are reported as a proportion relative to others. This does not definitely translate to the identification of causative organism. Moreover, the genomic databases are public in nature and can be annotated, annotated by anyone. So the tight regulations over genomic reference libraries are needed to ensure quality control. So when we compare the standard culture with the technologies what I've described, in EQ, you see it detects atypical and subthreshold species by growing bacteria on, on, under different modified conditions. PCR matches extracted microbial DNA to limited PCR panels, whereas NGS identifies all species in the sample and lists by dominance. So coming to the emerging diagnostic plan, newer platforms, they include biosensors, microfluidics, and lab object technology. So I'll be talking on biosensor-based diagnosis of UTI. What is biosensor? Biosensor is a molecular sensing device composed of recognition element and a transducer. Specific binding of target and light, that is the bacteria, to the recognition element generates a measurable signal that is detectable via the transducer. You can see here the bacteria uh, attached to the transfer, which is uh, detected as a measurable signal. So the electrochemical uh, biosensors detects uropathogens based on sandwich hybridization of bacterial 16S rRNA with a captured DNA oligonucleotide as a recognition element and a labeled DNA probe as a transducer. So these electrochemical uh, biosensor platform consists of an array of individual sensors to detect different bacteria. You can see in the picture, the different uh, individual uh, uh, arrays of sensors detects different type of bacteria. And moreover, it's also possible to detect the antibiotic uh, susceptibility uh, of these bacteria to different antibiotics. So to conclude, there's an ever increasing demand for improved and efficient diagnosis of UTI. Advances in UTI diagnostics have the potential to provide precision medicine for this common infection, giving the right drug at the right dose to the right patients at the right time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Surya Prakash. Next in the session is a guest lecture by Dr. Ishwar Chandra of uh, Hyderabad. He is a renowned uh, senior radiologist with uh, high academic instinct. We request Dr. Ishwak Chandra to present you. Now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, our guest speaker, Dr. Ishwar Chandra, who will be giving this talk on imaging in acute renal and prostatic infections. Uh, Dr. Ishwar Chandra is a renowned radiologist. He did his MBBS from Kakatiya Medical College, Warangal, and post-graduation, uh, that is MD in radiology from PGI Merchandigar. He's also a fellow of Royal College of Radiologists from London. Presently, is working as chief radiologist in Virinji Hospitals, Hyderabad. He has got membership from many prestigious uh, radiology associations. He has got 13 publications to his credit, and he has over 180 invited lectures. Now, I invite Dr. Ishwar, Ishwar Chandra to give his talk on imaging in acute renal and prostatic infections. Good morning, everyone. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'll be talking about imaging of acute uh, renal and prostatic infections. As you all know, uh, acute polynephritis is most commonly due to a bacterial infection of the renal pelvis and parenchyma. Uh, females are uh, much more commonly affected than males in a ratio of 5 to 1. And the most classical clinical findings include uh, 
acute onset of fever, flank pain, and a positive Murphy's kidney punch. This is seen in uh, uh, most of the cases in the classical setting. Now, this infection could be SNP uh, from the unity bladder, or it could be hematogenous in a certain uh, percentage of cases. Uh, it could be uncomplicated, or it could be complicated uh, in terms of, uh, say, presence of obstruction, uh, presence of uh, abscesses or presence of air in the collecting system or in the parenchyma. E. coli is the most commonly uh, detected organism. Now, the, the two most common imaging modalities are ultrasound and CT. Each has got its own advantages, but in a given setting, in an optimal setting, CT would uh, definitely play a greater role than ultrasound, especially in the detection of complications. And it, it's also to be noted that the healing process lacks clinical improvement. Uh, so the presence of uh, imaging findings should not be taken as persistence of infection. Now, the findings of on the infection of acute pyelonephritis, uh, they're not specific for this uh, entity, but they could also be seen in other disorders of uh, renal involvement by drugs or granulomatous diseases or immunologically mediated diseases and metabolic disorders. Now, the primary goal of imaging is to know about the nature of the infection and the extent of the disease. In an uncomplicated infection, uh, usually the imaging doesn't play much role, but however, it plays a greater role when uh, you're trying to identify significant complications like the presence of uh, gas forming infections, abscesses, and obstruction. Now, what are the indications for imaging? Now, whenever any adult patient uh, with a urinary tract infection is responding poorly to appropriate antibiotic therapy, even after uh, three days of, uh, after the onset of uh, symptoms. So that's an indication for imaging to rule out for, uh, uh, to look for any complications or associated anomalies. Uh, or adults or patients who have recurrent episodes of infection, you are treated once, but again, it recurs, then uh, you want to rule out stones, you want to rule out uh, renal obstruction. Uh, you want to look for any presence of abscesses or uh, a predisposition in the form of a congenital anomaly. Now, these are the commonly used imaging modalities. Uh, uh, we'll see what is the role of each in the subsequent slides. Now, in the current day practice, radiographs have got a limited role. Uh, even though radiographs are normal or abnormal, we tend to go for cross section imaging, especially in the setting of uh, looking for complications. On the radiographs, you can uh, look for calculi or presence of gas in the kidneys or in the urinary bladder, especially in the setting of gas forming organisms. And you also use uh, radiographs in the follow up after treatment. You want to look at the position of the stents or you want to look at the, whether the calculus has completely been removed or there are fragments. So, this is an example of a uh, KUB uh, in a patient who presented with right flank pain. You see a large uh, air fluid level in the right renal area, which is due to an anthocyanthus pyelonephritis in this uh, uh, patient. Now, ultrasound, though easily available, it's insensitive in the detection of uh, pyelonephritis. The literature says uh, not more than 20 to 25 percent of the patients you tend to look uh, diagnose on ultrasound. You could have kidney enlargement, you could have loss of renal sinus fat, you could have a decreased ecotexture with loss of cortical medullary differentiation. If you do a color doppler, you could find areas of hyperperfusion, you could also find uh, complications like obstructions or abscess formations, hydronephrosis, or bladder wall thickening, debris in the urine, so on and so forth. So this kidney is globally enlarged, globally reduced in ecotexture with loss of CMD, very classical for uh, uh, acute pyelonephritis. And this another patient who has a hydronephrosis and large kidney with presence of this filling defect in the uh, collecting system in the renal pelvis. And this particular appearance is typically seen in candida um, pyelonephritis. Another example where ultrasound would show you the obstruction, presence of calcula in the pelvis, presence of these internal echoes in the collecting system. And it also shows the bladder increased wall thickness, internal echoes, fluid debris levels, so indicating presence of cystitis, presence of an obstructed system. And uh, of course, CT would show these findings in much greater detail. We have a large kidney, parenchymal atrophy, presence of uh, severe hydronephrosis, a staghorn calculus. And you also find that there is perinephric fat stranding associated with thickening of the gerota fascia on the left side, implying that there is. It's an obstructed, infected system with presence of pyelonephrosis as well. Now, as we've seen, CT 
So we could do it on a non-contrast CT or a contrast enhanced CT. Even on a non-contrast CT, you can look for the presence of gas, calculi, the presence of hemorrhage, uh, renal enlargement, inflammation in the kidney and in the perinephric regions, and of course, the presence of obstruction. And whenever you are giving contrast, uh, uh, it's important to obtain the scans, uh, not immediately, but the best period is around 50 to 90 seconds after injection, where the classical finding is one or more wedge-shaped areas or streaky zones of uh, hypo enhancement or lesser enhancement that extend from the center of the kidney, from the papilla to the renal cortex, which are sharply demarcated. Now, you could also have secondary signs like uh, enlargement of the kidney, perinephric fast timing, retrovitamin facial thickening, abscess formations, uh, etc. So this is a, a classical case of acute paranephritis. This is in the nephrographic uh, phase, which was ob obtained around 60 seconds after contrast enhanced or contrast administration. You find a globally enlarged kidney. The normal reniform shape is lost. This appears more globular extensive areas of these wedge-shaped hypoattenuation with small, more well-defined foci of uh, hypoenhancement, subtle perinephric fat stranding. Same, uh, you all, you can, these uh, findings can also be seen on the excretory phase where the contrast is seen in the chemises and these areas tend to persist uh, in terms of those hypoattenuation or hypoenhancement. Now this process could also start uh, focally or it could uh, uh, persist focally as well. So this is another example, wedge-shaped uh, hypo, hypo enhancement extending from the medullary region to the uh, surface of the kidney, perinephric fat standing, facial thickening on the axial as well as the coronal planes. Previously, there, is, there were numerous terms for this as lobar nephronia, focal pyelonephritis, focal bacterial nephritis, etc. But uh, this is a focal form of acute uh, pyelonephritis in this setting. Now, this could also be bilateral in certain instances, like we have multiple areas of hyperattenuation involving both the kidneys uh, in this uh, enhanced uh, contrast enhanced axial scan, implying that it's a bilateral uh, uh, pyelonephritis. Now, complications can also be very well depicted on uh, uh, CT scan. Here you find that there's a large posterior subcapsular fluid collection, which is compressing the kidney anteriorly. So this is an example of a, a complication of acute paranephritis in this patient, which uh, developed a week after the patient became symptomatic. Now the presence of gas uh, is an important thing to identify in whatever imaging you, uh, you uh, obtain. Be it a plain radiograph, be it ultrasound. Uh, of course, CT is much more easier and sensitive for picking up uh, air. Here, uh, in this ultrasound of the kidney, right kidney, this shows global enlargement, reduced ecotexture. You can also find these hyperechoic uh, uh, foci in the collecting system, not to be mistaken for calcifications or calculi. So air also can be very well picked up if you look for it. And the presence of air within the urinary bladder with evidence of internal echoes. So there's evidence of air in the bladder, air in the kidney, very classical for acute emphysematous pyelonephritis. And you do the CT of the same patient, you find an enlarged kidney with the presence of air in the collecting system with adjacent perinephric inflammation. The same uh, radiograph, what you have seen before, the presence of uh, air in the right renal area. Here you find that the kidney is enlarged, presence of uh, extensive intraparenchymal air with fluid collections, subcapsular abscess with air fluid level. So there's a very severe form of uh, emphysematous pyelonephritis where the patient went on to have a nephrectomy in this particular instance. But there's a classification of uh, the uh, emphysematous pyelonephritis, the various other classifications as well. But uh, it, uh, it implies the severity of the extent of disease. If the air is only limited to the collecting system, that has got a much better prognosis. Whereas if it's bilateral, then the mortality and morbidity would be very high to the tune of 50 to 80 percent uh, uh, as well. Now, renal abscesses uh, tend to form uh, much later. They tend to be well defined, round or oval, hypoechoic, or uh, lesions appearing in the kidney. They will not show any color doppler. Color Doppler show peripheral areas of uh, uh, increased uh, vascularity, uh, much more better seen on a contrast enhanced CT. So uh, these appear as more well defined than, than the wedge shaped areas, what you have seen in pyelonephritis. They could also extend into the perinephric space, uh, as in this case. There would be rim enhancement, 
it appears as a hypodense lesion, rim enhancement, central low density with adjacent uh, inflammation. So this is important to identify because the renal abscess uh, needs to be drained in most of the instances, either percutaneously or surgically as deemed to be appropriate. Now, MRI would play a greater role, uh, especially in pregnant uh, patients who develop, uh, who develop obstruction and uh, infection, or in those patients who have allergy to iodinated contrast. Now, the findings are similar to CT. Whatever you have seen on CT, the same findings would be seen, global enlargement, uh, areas of hypo um, enhancement on the contrast enhanced scan, perinephric uh, inflammatory changes. Here you find the enlarged right kidney, altered signal, uh, hypo intense calcula in the pelvis here and smaller calcula here, perinephric fat stranding. This patient had, uh, uh, this patient had uh, uh, pyelonephritis with perinephric inflammation due to an abstracting calculus in the renal pelvis. Uh, another setting where uh, uh, presence of infection and uh, complications are better evaluated is in the transplant kidney setting. So this patient uh, transplant kidney appears and last year there's a collection in the perinephric uh, uh, region on the supralateral aspect and on the contrast enhanced MR you find that there is rim enhancement consistent with a perinephric abscess seen also on the axial T2 as well as the axial T1 post-contrast scans. This, is the, uh, this was the same patient what we have seen before, the Saigon calculus, the contrast enhanced CT showing poor enhancement on the right side and areas of perinephric inflammation. A nuclear medicine would play a greater role in uh, children especially uh, you want to look at uh, uh, areas of uh, uh, pore perfusion or scarring in a later stage. So this is how the normal kidneys look in a technician 99 DMSA scan, smooth contours, no evidence of any uh, perfusion defects. When you do a uh, scan in the acute phase, what you find is areas of hypoperfusion. This patient had uh, this defect in the upper pole, but in the uh, uh, given setting, you need to have a clinical correlation because a prior scar also could look like this. So if you want to differentiate a scar from an acute infection, you need to do another scan. Uh, a couple of months later, if it returns to normal, this would, uh, is a, uh, this would represent an acute infection and not a scar here. So another patient uh, showing uh, defects at the upper pole and the lower pole on the left kidney here. And then the anterior again that's showing that. So this was again uh, multiple foci of uh, infection in the left kidney due to paranephritis. Now coming to acute prostatitis. Now prostatitis is basically a clinical diagnosis and role of imaging is not to diagnose prostatitis on ultrasound or CT. Role of imaging is only to evaluate for abscess formation and if necessary act as a guidance to aspirate or uh, drain that abscess. So these are all the various ultrasound findings of acute prostatitis, capsule thickening, prostatic enlargement, calcli, hypercalo, but uh, most of the times we would not be uh, doing uh, ultrasound to diagnose prostatitis, but only to look for the complication of abscess. On the CT enhanced, uh, axial enhanced CT, what you find here is a collection here, multi-septated. And uh, on a, again, another patient with T2 weighted coronal imaging showing collections in the prostate and diffusion weighted imaging would play a greater role in picking up abscess from inflammation and the contrast mask and again showing the high point dense collection here with peripheral enhancement. And sometimes rarely can also have acute emphysematous prostatitis, presence of extensive air here and uh, associated with seminal vesiculitis. So in conclusions, Acute renal infections, imaging is not routinely indicated in cases of uncomplicated renal uh, infection. And ultrasound is frequently used to screen for obstruction or renal calculi or underlying anomalies. CT is the most highly sensitive uh, imaging uh, modality to diagnose and look for complications. And uh, in uh, equivocal cases, high risk patients, especially diabetics and immunocompromised, you want to look for any complications. CT is the modality of choice. And it determines the nature as well as extension of uh, extent of disease very well. And of course, detection of complications. And prostatitis is a clinical diagnosis and role of imaging is only uh, in the evaluation of abscess formation, wherein ultrasound, a transrectal ultrasound or uh, as appropriate, a CT or MR would help us. So my acknowledgements to the organizers uh, for having me uh, deliver this lecture.
especially to friends Dr. Malikajan Reddy and Dr. Sir Prakash Reddy along with the executive team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Isha Chandra for a wonderful uh, presentation and a very informative talk. On behalf of ASC, I would like to thank you on, and also on behalf of the chairpersons. Now we have 10 minutes of uh, questions and answers uh, session. Uh, there were some uh, questions in the chat boxes which uh, Dr. has uh, already uh, uh, answered. I have one question to Dr. Uh, Manohar. Manohar, uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you have mentioned that uh, antimicrobial coated catheters uh, will reduce uh, the uh, decrease the urinary tract infections in uh, long term catheterizations. So, uh, is antimicrobial coated catheters are available uh, in our country? And what are the antimicrobial uh, agents uh, which are used to? Uh, caught these catheters. So actually, the antimicrobial agents are used are even ceftazidone, nitrofurosone is available. But the problem is getting these catheters is very difficult, sir. We have a ceftazidone coated, nitrofurosone coated is available, sir, actually. But getting these catheters are difficult here. Yeah. Dr. Prasad, if I may add a small statement here. I don't think evidence-based studies have shown any difference in infections by using antimicrobial catheters. Even silver impregnated catheters have not reduced the incidence of UTIs. I'm talking of uh, control studies. Even apparent coated, all this they have uh, shown that uh, trials have done, but still the results are same. Yeah, that's exactly. Coated or non-coated. So that, that's why they said the main. Following the six C's will help us for prevention, preventing the urinary tract infections. Including all the maneuvers such as medial cleansing, all those, everything is what we have believed to learn as we learned in catheter placement and catheter care, do not have any impact on the incidence of uh, UTIs. Uh, Manohar, yes, uh, does it matter if you use uh, silicon catheter or uh, latex catheters, the incidence of infections? Uh, as, no, sir, actually, it has given, but uh, when you have trialed, only for long term, we are using the silicon catheters, but uh, as such, only it will, the few things have shown that crystallization is reduced by using a silicon catheter. The biofilm formation will biofilm be less. Formation is yeah, silicon. Because we have two things, sir. One is the biofilm and the non-crystallization and non-crystallization formation. The organisms can be formed as a non-crystallization crystallization formation. But by using a silicon catheter, they have showed re reduction of an, a, this crystalline formation. That's all. Uh, doc Dr. Dr. Manohar, does the size of the catheter matter with the urinary tract infection? No, sir. No. So can I ask a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Ishwar, I was just looking at in a, uh, if you have a a pregnant lady or someone who is allergic to iodinated contrast and then uh, you need to do an MRI, what would be the uh, pickup of a small uretric stone without significant hydronephrosis and maybe some amount of pyelonephritis agreed? Uh, could you just give us a limitations or um, of the MRI and then how can we go about in these cases? Uh, Dr. Malik, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, Non-obstructive ureteric calculi, I think MR would uh, definitely be a, it, it would be a limitation on MR. So a CT would be better in that instance. But uh, it's very, I think it would be very unlikely for a non-obstructive ureteric calculus uh, leading to acute paranephritis uh, in that setting. But uh, uh, all said and done, uh, MR is as sensitive or more sensitive than CT in picking up acute paranephritis, all the complications. So in the given setting of a pregnant woman with uh, suspe suspected obstruction or pyelonephritis or in uh, patients with allergy to contrast agents or uh, in patients uh, who have a marginal renal function or in renal failure, I think MR can be freely be done uh, in lieu of a CT. Uh, if you want to look at for complications, you could give IV gadolinium as well. But uh, ureteric calculi, small, non-obstructive, uh, I think MR is definitely not the modality. We'll definitely lose them uh, in, in the pickup. 
So that means uh, you say that in case of an acute pyelonephritis, we should be ordering a contrast enhanced MR or a T1, just a plain T1, T2 MR versus the CT. No. In any other patient. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, ideal case scenario, you should be requesting for a contrast enhanced CT to get the type of enhancement and type of involvement of the parenchyma, which would not be seen on a uh, plain CT. Plain MR is definitely blood better than a plain uh, CT in terms of picking up. The other uh, indication would be in terms of in patients with uh, ADPKD who present with acute flank pain, you're not too sure whether it's due to hemorrhage or whether it's due to an infection, then uh, please, please uh, request for a plain MR over a plain CT because MR has got uh, tremendous uh, tissue contrast capabilities in differentiating hemorrhage from an abscess or an infected cyst. And you could even uh, target that cyst uh, and uh, even drain it on ultrasound or aspirate. Whereas a plain CT would be pretty poor in picking up. So ADPKD, anytime uh, an MR would be uh, the modality of choice in picking up. So textbook wise, a, a contrast enhanced CT or an MR, but uh, sometimes uh, due to constraints of uh, whatever clinical or financial, we just uh, tend to do a plain CT or a plain MR. That should suffice uh, for most instances in our type of practice as well. Yeah, the, uh, Dr. Ishwar sir, how yeah. safe is the low dose CT in a uh, pregnant lady to detect uh, these stones? Uh, in pregnancy, it, it, it's just simple that it's not uh, a uh, frightening modality to do. It, it's all uh, on the risk benefit ratio. If you want to rule out a stone, definitely there's no harm in doing a, a plain CT, low dose CT of the abdomen or pelvis. Uh, we tend to do it sometimes, especially in patients with trauma. A pregnant patient comes with a trauma to the abdomen. We do a CT, even if we give IV contrast as well. So it, it just depends upon the, uh, the benefit a particular modality is going to give you. If you need that, please go ahead and do it. There's no harm in doing it, even a plain CT of the abdomen and pelvis in a pregnant patient. But usually you tend to avoid in the period of organogenesis. In the two to eight weeks, the first uh, few months, we tend to avoid it. But uh, usually that's not the usual age to, usual period of gestation to have an infection. Usually they have in the second or third trimester, then uh, there's no harm in doing a plain CT as well. But I would prefer an MR. If you do a diligent MR, uh, you couldn't pick up uh, calculi as well, even in the ureter or otherwise. Uh, this is the Dr. Ishwar. Uh, uh, which is actually a question that Dr. Kamath has put in the chat box. Tips to place PCN in emphysematous pyelonephritis, where the gas shadows uh, over, uh, I mean, cover the pelvic calcium system. So would you have, have any recommendations to make on how to yeah. access the PCS in case there is simultaneous obstruction that needs a drainage? True. Uh, I think I was about to answer that, right? Uh, if the gas is uh, too much uh, obscuring your... Uh, uh, the window of uh, seeing the kidney, I would do. A, I would use a CT to place it. That's a very simple thing. You just uh, everything is under vision. It'll not take more than five to ten minutes. So, uh, if it is preventing your visibility, please go ahead for a CT. Or uh, sometimes you could do a fluoroscopy as well. But a CT is much more easier and simpler in terms of go to a CT, put the needle, and then maybe inject contrast, and then you can. Uh, finish the procedure there itself or if you want to go to take to the OT, that's, that's even uh, done. Uh, that's what I would do, especially in okay. gas-forming organisms anywhere in the body, where uh, the, even for a liver abscess with gas or a prosthetic thing, we tend to do a CT to pancreatitis with abscesses with gas. Uh, a CT is much more simpler and uh, easier to do. Thank you, sir. And we move on to the next session, sir. Yeah, should. Yeah. Yeah, um, I thank, thank the, all the speakers and the chairpersons, Dr. Lakshman Prabhu, you, Dr. Prasad, Dr. Dorai Rajan, Dr. Jagdish for uh, conducting this first session. Now we move on to the next session. That is a section on session session on microbial factors. Uh, for this session, I invite uh, Dr. Malikarjan Reddy, the president uh, ASU, Dr. P. B. L. N. Murthy, and Dr. Jai Raman to be the chairpersons for this session. Now I hand over the session to Dr. Malikarjan Reddy. Thank you, Suri Prakash. So, welcome, Murthy sir, uh, Jairaman sir. Uh, sir, Murthy sir, please take over, sir. Yeah.
Thank you, Dr. Malikarjun Reddy. And I would that say thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to participate in this uh, prestigious uh, midterm conference. And uh, now the, there is a guest lecture from Dr. Ram Gopalakrishnan. He's an infectious disease specialist from Chennai. He will be talking on gram-negative infections in the urinary tract, in their evolution, pathogenesis, and all that. I'll so over to Ram Gopal Krishnan. I will be introducing Dr. Ram Gopal sir. Please play the video. Welcome to this wonderful session on microbial factors. Let me introduce you, Dr. Ram Gopal Krishnan, the Senior Consultant at Institute of Infectious Diseases, Apollo Hospitals, Chennai. He's been an alumni of uh, Madras Medical College, AMR Chandigarh, and then subsequently he uh, migrated to UK and then uh, had the residency in Bell College of Medicine, Houston, Texas. He's an American board certified uh, and recertified the fellow, fellowship in infectious diseases, uh, Wright State University, Dayton, Ohio. He has had many laurels in terms of presentations and publications. He has 76 journal publications, five book chapters and 255 plus invited lectures. He has been the adjunct professor of Tamil Nadu MGR University in India. He's an adjunct professor of distinguished clinical tutor Apollo Hospitals Education and Research Foundation. He's a past president of Clinical Infectious Diseases Society of India and is currently the chairman of treatment guidelines for antimicrobial use in common syndromes. He would be speaking on the evolution of a gram-negative bacterial uh, role and how it evolved to be a, such a dangerous bug. Welcome, Dr. Ram Gopal Krishna. Hello, my name is Dr. Ram Gopal Krishnan. Give me a minute while I share my slides. Right, so this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, this would be a kind of philosophical talk about how gram negatives have evolved to become such a dangerous threat in urological infections. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. We start off with a case, as all of us here are clinicians. This is a 50 year old male with diabetes, CKD, who had underwent a live related renal transplant three months ago. He'd had graft pyelonephritis about 20 days after the surgery and was treated with meropenem. The stents had been removed. He now had fever for the last four days, no specific localizing symptoms, exam unremarkable, creatinine was up and the urine was full of pus cells. So this is clearly urosepsis. And obviously the blood and the urine cultures flag gram negative bacilli. Now it's going to be another 24 hours that you know what you're dealing with and perhaps another 48 hours before you have all your sensitivities back. So what are you going to do here? So this is what we did. We ran a molecular test on the isolate in blood and we found out that it had this particular mechanism of resistance called OXA48. I'll explain what that means. And we started this patient not on cholestin, which is really a bad word when you're dealing with a transplant patient, but on ceftazidine avibactam, which is non-nephrotoxic, the patient improved after a 14-day course. And uh, you might as well, uh, you can guess that this is exactly what the, uh, the, the report showed. The uh, Klebsiella that grew was resistant to all beta-lactam antibiotics. And you can see here that the uh, imipenem MIC, meropenem MICs were all very high. It's carbapenem resistant. Cholestin would work, but at the cost of nephrotoxicity. So we were able to treat this patient with a non-nephrotoxic drugs drug using molecular mechanisms of resistance. So what is the problem we have on hand today? The problem is we are in the year 2021. That is the problem. Now, in yesteryears, for urosepsis caused by E. coli or Klebsiella, the usual causes, we could use a bunch of sensitive antibiotics without batting an eyelid. However, around the turn of the century, you can see how we started losing our cephalosporin. Cephalosporin sensitivity started falling off around the turn of the century, and it's going rapidly worse and worse, as I'll show you. And what is the reason? This, this bad word is called ESPL, extended spectrum beta lactamases, which basically chew up all, uh, all beta lactams, which are penicillins and cephalosporins. It started from an environmental organism and has now jumped across 
cross species to E. coli Klebsiella. There's one particular clone called CTXM15, which is the commonest one worldwide. Unfortunately, all of these co-carry resistance to quinolones and aminoglycosides on the same plasmid and carbapenems are the only reliable drug for seriously ill patients. So you can see here, these are US CDC data around 5-10% resistance or so. And this is resistance from, uh, from Dr. Ganesh Kamath's hospital. You can see how the glass ceiling broke there. That's the amount of resistance we have uh, right here in, in Chennai. And uh, this is the fact of the day. In the US, the resistance rates are pretty low, less than 10%. But, but in India, very high frequency of, of prevalence, both in community hospitals, as well as all over India. And it's clearly going up and up and up. And even in the US, this is a problem now. It's gone up by 53% uh, from that low figure, but it's nowhere near the problem we have in Indian hospitals. This is one of the seminal studies, a pan-Indian study, which showed that 60 to 60% uh, of E. coli and Klebs are resistant to cephalosporins. This is a big problem. You don't have drugs to treat these patients with. And you can see that this kind of phenomenon is seen whichever Indian center you look at, the E. coli and the Klebs are resistant to cephalosporins because of ESBL production. And overall nationwide figures are going up and up and up. This is the dated slide, goes back to 2004. It's far worse now. And it's not just a problem with India. It's a problem in many other parts of the developing world where antibiotic abuse is prevalent, China, Latin America, etc. You can see here, uh, Dr. Ganesh Kamath, his hospital, SMF in Chennai. These are the resistance figures in terms of cephalosporins. So you just can't use cephalosporins to treat uh, E. coli urosepsis in these hospitals or for that matter, in any Indian hospital. Now, India and Pakistan played each other at cricket recently. This was one match which uh, India narrowly lost. You can see here that Pakistan produces slightly more ESPLs among its Klebsiella uh, isolates. Um, and, and it turns out that if you are abroad, say if you are you reside in the US or the UK, and you come to India, the first thing they, they look at you and say, do you have ESPL in your bowel? So travelers pick this up when they come here. How do they get it? By number one, drinking the water. Number two, by traveling, number three, by getting diarrhea, and number four, by taking antibiotics for diarrhea. So it's a fact of life that if you're from India, you are labeled an ESPL carrier when you go, go back. That is the scale of the problem. And it's not just residing in your bowel. It clearly causes urosepsis. This is seen in 50% of E. coli and Klebsiella. This study was as far back as 10 years ago. The urinary tract was the source. And uh, in Aligar, in, in UP, 42% of community acquired UTIs are caused by ESBL producers. So these are here to stay and they've been around for more than a decade now. And it doesn't matter whether you, it does really matter whether you treat them right or wrong. If you give them the wrong antibiotics, your mortality rate roughly doubles 18 to 35%, etc. If you give the correct antibiotic late, delay in starting a carbapenem, look at how high your mortality rates uh, differ between ESBL and non-ESBL producers. So in urosepsis, you've got to catch these bugs early and hit them hard or you're done for. So what did we Indian clinicians uh, react? We got to use carbapenems routinely instead of using quinolones and aminoglycosides like in the good old days, we were forced to use carbapenems because of increasing cephalosporin resistance. And that was the soup of the day for the first uh, 10 years of the century. Till this paper came out, this was uh, in 2010 in the Lancet. And they said that many centers in India were producing this carbapenem resistant E. coli and Klebsiella, which tourists from the UK, medical tourists, picked up during procedures and took back to the UK with them uh, over India. Now, some of these isolates were actually from my hospital, Apollo in Chennai. And after getting cosmetic surgery, they took back with them an unwelcome return gift in the form of this CR, carbapenem resistant isolate which was uh, christened New Delhi metallobetalactamase because it was first identified in our national capital. So although the UK people said, don't go to India, uh, that created a lot of controversy at that time, political issues at that point. What's more, a year later, this paper again came out in the Lancet, looking at Delhi, this is a map of Delhi, and this is where they sampled water from all around Delhi. And they found, that if you're in Delhi, don't drink the water there because it's contaminated. It's full of this NDM1. It's full of carbapenem resistant 
E. coli bacteria, not just E. coli bacteria, bad enough, but carbapenem resistant E. coli bacteria. So this was uh, shown to be a big problem, a community problem as far back as 10 years ago. And uh, this kind of graph is great if you're exporting television sets or vaccines or something good all over the world, but not so good if you're exporting drug resistant bacteria all over the world. And as far back as 10 years ago, it was estimated that up to a hundred million Indians carry NDM1 in their cut. It comes out on the pressure of antibiotics and, uh, and it sickens you when you are infirm, you have a urological procedure, etc. And not just in India, it's spread to as far a pace as Colorado, USA. So this is something which is spreading from India, made in India uh, and being exported elsewhere. Now, carbapenem resistance is not exclusive to India. Let's get that straight. There are other mechanisms of resistance. For instance, in the US, they have this mechanism of resistance called KPC, Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase 2, which is a different mechanism of resistance. Again, choose up all the beta lactams, only carbapenems work. Uh, sorry, carbapenems don't work as well. And Europe sees more of this mechanism, OXA48 and less KPC. And this is where all of us uh, have to dig into our microbiology and molecular biology for a brief classification of carbapenemases. Yes, this is important. Even for urologists, carbapenemases, which break down beta lactams, you can have the metallos of which NDM1, our country is, uh, is famous for, or should I say infamous for. The serine beta lactamases, KPC, the OXA48s fall in different classes. So this is clinically relevant. It's not theory. These can be inhibited by the BLBLIs we have in India today. And these can easily be inhibited by the drugs they have abroad. These can't be. So this is a very practical uh, clinical issue, not a theoretical issue. So this is a, a, a brief summary of on carbapenemase, the metalloenzymes, the bad ones, the ones found in India. The OXA series also found in India, and uh, but luckily treatable by this drug called avibactam. KPC is not a problem in India, forget about it. And Indian data shows that E. coli carry NDM1, so really difficult to treat. And the Klebsiella's, on the other hand, shows, the, shows largely OXA48 a little easier to treat. So carbapenems are not a free ride anymore. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And we recommend we, you don't use them unless they're clearly indicated. If, if ESBL production is not a problem, say it's a virus or it's a sensitive organism, don't use it. If ESBL producers are in low inoculum, not a serious infection, again, don't use. And if carbapenem resistance is already there, don't use. So, so that, uh, that horse has bolted from the stable. So what did Indian clinicians start using uh, after 2010? Back to the future, polymyxins, drugs that were discarded in the 1970s, now in widespread use. These are basically soaks that disrupt cell membranes. Two, two preparations, urologists should always use polystin. That's the one that gets into the renal tract. Polymyxin B is non-renally eliminated. And you can see here, the use of polymyxins took off through the roof um, in the latter part of the previous decade. This is US data. And you can see the number of papers going up, worryingly the number of papers describing collagen resistance. So use, abuse, and you will lose. So this is the recurrent theme in terms of antibiotic use and antimicrobial resistance. There are two types of resistance in, uh, in, in, of col to cholesterol in enterobacteriaceae. Chromosomal is what we usually see in India. Plasmid mediated, which has emerged in China, but luckily is not widespread so far. And this is uh, Apollo Chennai data where I practice. You can see here that overall, you, you, cholestin resistance is going up. The Klebsiella's are becoming more and more resistant. And roughly about 4% of Klebsiella isolates are cholestin resistant. I don't have a good drug to treat these patients with. So this is where we are heading in terms of resistance, in, in terms of hospital acquired, uh, Klebsiella especially, and to a lesser extent, E. coli. We published some of this data four years ago, 24 patients with cholesterol resistant gram-negative isolates. This is, this is an emerging but real problem in India today. So what do you do? You do what the pharma guys tell you to do. You reach for newer antibiotics. Are they the answer? Well, phosphomycin has been available in India. Urologists would be familiar with this drug because they use it for cystitis. It has no systemic penetration. We have an IV preparation, which we do use for severe E. coli infections. And uh, it has been used off-label for prostatitis. If you use high doses, you can sometimes get away for chronic prostatitis because many of these patients have either ESPLs or carbapenem resistant E. coli and Klebs, which you just can't treat with any other oral agent. 
Uh, data from Chennai show that it's a first, it's a promising agent in the era of MDM1. But look at this, it's the E. coli against which phosphomycin has low MICs against which it works. Against Klebs, forget about it. So don't rely on phosphomycin if you're dealing with Klebsiella, it's okay. Either, either orally for cystitis or systemically for, for E. coli urosepsis. The new BLBLIs, this is where the beta-lactamase inhibitor inhibits these bad carbapenemases and allows the beta-lactam to do the job. Of these, only AV-Bactam is available in India. We're all familiar with Sulbactam, Cephaperazone Sulbactam, Amoxclav, etc. But the new ones are hardier and can inhibit some of these. AV-Bactam is available in India. But the problem is the metallo-beta-lactamases, this is the problem we have in India, are uh, inhibited only by astronam av bactam to a lesser extent by cefidarocol. On the other hand, KPC, which is widespread in the US, has a lot of options. So you can see here the pharma guys are enjoying themselves selling these drugs in the US. They don't have a market in India because we have a different mechanism of resistance. Ceftazidime av bactam is available in India. I showed you that case. It is not active against NDM1. That's very important to realize. If you have this OXA48 mechanism of resistance, which is quite common in CLEP CLS, yes, you can use it. So it will not work against the majority of carbapenem resistant E. coli, may work against CLEP CLS. It's been compared versus cholesterol. And obviously, when you compare it with a nephrotoxic old drug, it did do better, even in terms of mortality. But what we really need is this drug called Astrionam AV Bactam. Astrionam is intrinsically active against NDM1 and in combination with AV Bactam, that may be the answer. So this is the uh, this is what we are looking to get. This drug is not yet available in India. The, the Astrionam takes care of the NDM1, AV Bactam takes care of the other molecular mechanisms of resistance. And this has been looked at, for instance, in this study, this is an in vitro study from Velour, and you can actually test for synergy when you put these two together. If there's a zone of inhibition between the uh, as to, between the ceftazidime maybe back time here and the astronam here, it means the together they're doing the job. So this is a strategy we frequently use clinically. We give ceftazidime maybe back time on one side and astronam on the other arm clinically uh, when we want to avoid cholesterol therapy. And in this study in the US, uh, this approach actually had a lower 30-day mortality compared to giving cholesterol. So this is a strategy we often follow in patients who are renally impaired, who have urosepsis. Now, that's not the end of the story. The bugs are always getting smarter. I spoke to you about many mechanisms of resistance all through carbapenemases. In other words, the bug produces an enzyme which chews up the carbapenem. However, a new and dangerous mechanism of resistance is emerging the bug does not allow the carbapenem to bind, altered penicillin binding proteins. And this is again a paper from India. Where else does uh, resistance emerge from? From ground zero, which is India. They looked at many Indian hospitals and they found that even this new drug, Astronam AV Bactam, which would be expected to work, was not working. They looked at the genes and they found an insertion of four amino acids, which was different. So the bug had mutated and did not allow the, the drug to bind to it, a different mechanism of resistance. And therefore, this is emerging in India and it just will, uh, will really make E. coli a big problem. CR E. coli is a big problem when it produces NDM1. This new drug will not work against it. Luckily, not a problem with Klebsiella or others so far. There's a new drug around the corner. It should be marketed in India in a year or so. Uh, this is a Trojan horse drug which sneaks in into the gram-negative cell wall through ion transport channels. And it supposedly works against all molecular mechanisms of resistance. But although NDM1, there may be a problem with it. So watch out for this drug. Already resistance has been described, however. So don't hold your breath as to how long it's going to last. Just a word on ferropenem. It is not a carbapenem. It's got a seductive name. And because of this seductive name, it... It really has sold a lot, so don't prescribe it. But if you are into the stock market, buy the company which makes it because they're really making a lot of money and, and laughing all the way to the bank. So we have this big issue of antimicrobial resistance. What are we doing about it? Uh, first of all, if you're in Hyderabad, don't drink the water there. All the, the entire, uh, all these antibiotics are found in the water there. They've shown this because there's a big pharma company presence, they all discharge their antibiotics into the open sewage. And that's a big problem. Tap water from villages was not contaminated, but it did contain bacteria 
with resistance genes. And if you are in Delhi, once again, don't uh, drink that juicy, don't eat that juicy chicken leg along with the water, because that is contaminated with antibiotics too. They have shown this as well. So you can see how environment is contaminated by antibiotics in our country. And this is kind of our government's approach towards the problem. They actually brought out a very good document in 2011, which lasted exactly six months because of pressure from the pharma industry saying, you can't use it, it'll reduce our profits. People in rural areas won't get any antibiotics. A group of well-meaning doctors, including uh, me, got together and said, we in Chennai declared that antimicrobial resistance is a big headache. Our infectious disease society uh, uh, endorsed this. Uh, and we need to monitor these high-end antibiotics. But and this was really well taken abroad. This is Lancet saying, what a wonderful thing Chennai is actually doing. This was the Journal of the American Medical Association. And ultimately what happened, the government started putting out ads, be careful before you take antibiotics. Now I'm not sure how many of you read this and I'm certain none of you follow this. You can walk into any store, uh, certainly in Chennai and get antibiotics without a prescription. All kinds of viruses are treated with antibiotics although these baby steps are out there and the government is spending uh, money trying to convince you not to take these antibiotics. There's a so-called Schedule H1, where you're not supposed to sell antibiotics over the counter. They've started regulating veterinary antibiotics, but whether it's being implemented or not, we don't know. There's a big Delhi declaration by the government, which followed the Chennai declaration. Not much change on the ground, really. The government in 2019, to its credit, banned cholestin in animals. Can you believe it? The, the last drug, uh, the last resort antibiotic in humans is actually being given to animals as feed to make them fatter. Uh, luckily, they've banned that about a couple of years ago. And just hot off the press uh, last month, we have this advisory saying all medical colleges should start teaching antimicrobial resistance, hospital infection control, infection control committees, etc. So they are trying to get into education in a big way. But really, this is the problem. Bacteria are always smarter. Now, well before the human race came out, well before, this was many, many years ago, bacteria were found to have these antimicrobial resistance genes. And it only requires exposure to the antibiotics to prod them into production. So this is not a war we are easily going to win. So this is a problem. Antibiotic resistance was there before antibiotics. So these, this is my uh, concluding slide. E. coli and Klebsiella are steadily getting worse in terms of antimicrobial resistance and uh, urologists may not be able to do surgeries in the future because all their patients are going to get infected with untreatable bugs. The knowledge and use of mechanisms of resistance is clinically important because you can try to, to smart, outsmarten the bugs at least temp temporarily as I showed you in that case. So new antibiotics are not anywhere around the corner and they go away quickly because we don't preserve them well. And in India, the government is doing little about it against worsening antimicrobial resistance, too little, too late. So prior to 1980, cotrimoxazole, prior to 90, fluoroquinolones, prior to 2000, third generation CEFs, prior to 2010, carbapenems, then it became cholestin. What's going to be left 10 years down the road? You tell me. Thank you very much. Um, Malikarjan, can I talk? Good, sir. Yeah, it's an excellent uh, talk, sir. Excellent information. I think we should all be careful. We know that the antibiotics we profusely use, especially endurological operations, there's no surprise, which I have seen, number of community acquired infections we are seeing are resistant to all organisms, only sensitive to cholesterol. Sir, we will go ahead. Thank you, sir. Sir, Thank you. Uh, take the questions. Uh, comments at the end of the sessions. Uh, Dr. Malligajun, shall I introduce Dr. Ganesh Kopalak? Please, sir. Yeah. Uh, good morning to everyone. Let me thank the organizers of this workshop for uh, asking me to start this uh, uh, session. Uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Ganesh Kopalakrishnan. Of course, uh, he is well known to all of us. He will be speaking on beyond antibiotics in urinary infections. Uh, over to Dr. Ganesh Kopalakrishnan. Beyond antibiotics in urinary tract infection in women. What does Google have to say about this? Stay hydrated, urinate when needed, 
drink cranberry juice, use probiotics, vitamin C, wipe front to back, and good sexual hygiene. Do you think I'm going to tell you anything different? Probably yes. But what are the assumptions that I'm making? That a urine sample is corrected properly, the labs are certified and the guidelines are followed, and all the labs are under quality control. I'm sad to say that when I looked at some of the labs in our country and some of the reporting and the way they do their cultures, they are far from ideal. What is the definition of a recurrent urinary infection in a woman? Three episodes in one year or two episodes in six months. A post wide residue of 30 ml in women with recurrent UTI is supposed to be significant in a study that was published by Halen in 1999. And a euro flow below the 10th percentile of the Liverpool nomogram is also significant in such women. Why is this such an important issue? The cost to the exchequer in the Western world is $3.5 billion every year. I do not know what the value in this country is, but I know that every woman who has a urinary tract infection or even something remotely suspicious of a UTI will run to the nearest physician, be a surgeon, a pediatrician, a gynecologist, a urologist, and the easiest thing that they would do is to prescribe a urinary antibiotic. What is a pathogenesis? This is a very familiar slide to most of you, but as far as women are concerned, there is no doubt about the fact that there is perianal, perivaginal colonization and migration of bacteria through the milking action of the urethra into the bladder where these bacteria actually colonize. So it is vital that when we look at pathogenesis of urinary tract infection, that we must address the bowel in a lot of these women who have recurrent infections. The basic processes involved are vaginal and epithelial adherence, migration to the bladder, colonization and internalization of the bacteria. And a term that has been used for such an event is called quiescent intracellular reservoirs producing bacterial communities. So you can imagine that in the urinary bladder, you would have small reservoirs of bacteria which are hiding around and waiting for the opportune moment uh, to show their uh, face. And that is why the bladder has been termed as a microbial jungle. And, but we need to distinguish between the good guys and the bad bacteria. We are familiar with two clinical scenarios that happen in women with recurrent urinary infection. The first is a 25 year old sexually active woman who has recurrent UTI, is fed up and wants to reduce her visits to hospital. The second is a postmenopausal woman with burning in the vagina, labial skin, and the tip of the urethra, and pain at the end of micturition. So what is there beyond antibiotics? I have listed an entire gamut of uh, treatments that are available, and I don't think in 10 minutes I can go through this entire list with you. But I'm going to touch on a few important aspects of what is there beyond antibiotics in your brain tract infection. Vaccines are the flavor of the year, flavor of the month or whatever you may call it. And so why not we have vaccines for a strategy to prevent bacterial colonization? It's not that this has been not studied before, it has been studied. And both surface antigen and inactivated whole bacterium is used to create a vaccine for these bacterial infections. These vaccines contain the O antigens, the fibril subunits, the alpha hemolysin, and the siderophores, which are all part of the bacteria. The current vaccines that are available, Eurovaxon, which is one tablet daily for three months, Eurovac, which is vaginal suppository, uh, EPEC4V is actually all the four, uh, the four E. coli serotypes, uh, O antigens, one intramuscular dose. And what has recently been uh, published and recently been uh, spoken about at the EA, EAU that was uh, just recently concluded is Euromune, which is a sublingual uh, vaccine, which has been uh, done in a randomized study. And I think this is something that we need to look for, forward to in the near future. There are some new vaccine candidates and these act by targeting adhesions, targeting the capsule, targeting the toxins which are released by the bacteria and targeting the iron metabolism, because we know that iron metabolism is necessary for actually the survival of the bacteria. There are certain small compounds which are available. These are actually low molecular weight compounds which are actually bacterial substrates. And they act as inhibitors by binding to active sites. And therefore, 
these some small compounds can be used to target the additions which are actually called pilicides these pile which are there as form uh, uh, as fimbria which actually cause adhesion to the mucosa of both the bacteria of the of the urinary bladder we can target the ureas and which is an enzyme which is produced and we, we are familiar as urologists with this because we deal with proteus stones and stagon calculi and can also use these small compounds to target the capsule nutraceuticals very popular indeed and the famous among them is actually cranberry cranberry juice is uh, consumed by by the liters in in many countries and in india also because now freely available but let me warn you that the juice actually is not as good as a tablet the juice actually does not contain uh, too much of the pack a which is actually pro anthocyanin a which is necessary and you must have a dose of about 30 mg of of that particular thing and the juice does not contain this this compound the tablets are more useful in this situation and there have been studies which have been used uh, using uh, cat cranberry many people in the audience may not believe in it i believe in it i use it and some of the women on whom i've used it swear by it so you know this is something which is without any side effects it's worth a try in women who do have recurrent urinary tract infections uh, there is a resinous material which is called propolis which is actually combined sometimes with cranberry and this causes a little better adhesions uh, and therefore uh, slightly better in its uh, in its action urinary antiseptics i'm not sure many uh, know about this urinary antiseptic called mandelamin maleate this was something that uh, was very popular in in my institution in bello uh, because we imported this from the united states and for some reason when these import license stopped we couldn't get this mandelamin it was extremely cheap and uh, it was a wonderful agent as a urinary antiseptic and a lot of women actually used to come and we used to send prescriptions by post i remember sending prescriptions to my colleagues uh, and actually parceling this uh, particular urinary antiseptic to different uh, parts of india uh, from the law uh, for women who had recurrent urinary tract infection and i do not know why we are not able to market this in the country because this is something that has helped a lot of women uh, tide over the crises of recurrent urinary infections vaginal estrogen cream i think it's probably underused because there's a fear of malignancy this is very useful in postmenopausal women and some of these women may have had uh, treatment for breast cancer and there's a fear that actually if you use these estrogens you might actually propagate that malignancy but it's not it's not so uh, if you have obvious signs of postmenopausal vaginal uh, vaginitis then it's uh, reasonable to use the cream but sometimes the changes may not be apparent and if you have any doubts it's worth taking a biopsy and you'll be surprised that sometimes the biopsy may show these changes and sometimes the biopsy may biopsy may actually show uh, the lichen sclerosis so that is also something that we can see in women who have these recurrent symptoms which are suggestive of urinary tract infection i use this agent very freely and uh, i have really had no significant side effects patients have not complained about it i use the cream and i have a suggested protocol for them and i give it to them uh, on a type sheet so if any of you all are interested you can email me and send you what my protocol is there is a synergy with the use of estrogen cream with hyaluronic acid and chondroitin sulfate and if both can be used in some of these patients the hyaluronic acid uh, with the sulfate is a useful synergic action with vaginal estrogen cream vaginal lactobacillus there are multiple actions of this both bacteriostatic and bactericidal and the by products of this actually Uh, release uh, lactic acid and hydrogen peroxide and this actually exerts an effect to down regulate the virulence of the uh, bacteria in a trial that was uh, done for 12 months using uh, trimethoprim sulfamoxazole which is ceftran or bactrim uh, this agent was non inferior and therefore it's certainly worth trying and i think uh, you know probiotics are very popular they're available in all these uh, big department stores and i can see a lot of people actually consuming them and buying them Uh, there was a study a randomized study using uh, an agent called combining probiotic with cranberry versus a placebo and there was definitely a significant lowering of recurrent urinary tract infections in women who had this uh, vaginal lactobacillus so finally what are the key points and what i have to tell you there is no doubt that there is rising rates of microbial resistance in the world and we are to blame for this as doctors as physicians as surgeons 
there is an overuse and a misuse of antibiotics. The moment the government of India puts a ban on the sale of antibiotics from over the counter, I think we will all be helped. There's a threat to global public health as a result of this misuse of antibiotics. And we as urologists know the amount of recurrent urinary tract infections and resistant bacteria, which we are seeing uh, in, in our practice today. And therefore alternatives to antibiotics for the prevention of recurrent urinary infection is an active op uh, option. I've listed uh, a lot of the non-antibiotic management options in, in my earlier slides. There's no doubt that novel vaccines targeting adherence mechanisms of UPEC seem to be promising and more large scale human trials are required to determine the efficacy of this approach. However, the evidence for non-antibiotic measures is hampered by considerable heterogeneity and further placebo controlled ransomware trials of these agents are needed. I would recommend you to take this down and listen to Curtis Nickel. It is a good, uh, it's a good talk that he gave recently on uh, approaches to recurrent UTIs in women. And I would also suggest that you read these articles, uh, which I have listed here below, uh, to get a further understanding uh, and a more in-depth knowledge of what is there beyond antibiotics in the area of recurrent urinary tract infections in women. And therefore, as I conclude, I must thank the society, I must thank the uh, South Zone and the Association of Southern Urologists for once again choosing a topic which is absolutely dear to the heart of uh, our guru, our mentor, uh, Professor H. S. Butt, uh, who I fondly remember and with whom I've had long-standing relationship for many years. And it's a person who, uh, who I see every day in a picture in front of me. And uh, I, I, I can recall many of the words that he has used and he's going to be extremely proud and happy that we've chosen a topic of urinary tract infections uh, as the theme for his uh, commemorium today. So thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your uh, uh, valuable lecture on beyond antibiotics in urinary tract infections in women. Uh, shall I go to the next lecture by yes, uh, Dr. Santosh Kumar from Velour. He will be speaking on fungal urinary tract infections, non-invasive and invasive. Over to Dr. Santosh Kumar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the ASU for giving me this opportunity to talk on this uh, prestigious HS Bad Midterm workshop. The topic I'm going to cover is fungal urinary tract infection, both invasive and non-invasive. This is a rare disease, but in the present time, it's very relevant. Fungi or fungal UTI refers to candiduria due to candida species. There are other fungi also noted below, which uh, cause urinary tract infections, but for uh, as uh, candiduria is the most common infection, uh, most of the discussion on this presentation will be on candiduria. The risk factors for having a uh, fungal UTI is uh, old age, female sex, diabetes, use of antibiotics, patients on ventilators and who have been on TPN and long stays in hospitals. Urological patients who have urinary catheters, stents, PC and tubes, have urinary tract anomalies, have obstruction and have had instrumentation with not that but sterilized instruments at a high risk for fungal UTI. We need to understand what's the difference between candiduria and candidemia. So candiduria is pretty common, especially in the old female population in the hospital lying in the ICUs. Whereas candidemia is not that common, only about 1.3 or 2% of the patients with high risk would develop candidemia. However, candiduria alone is a high risk for mortality and treating it uh, does not prevent, decrease the mortality. So it looks like candiduria is a marker for a seriously ill patient in the hospital. So how does candid, uh, candiduria, the candida species get into our body? Much similar to any other UTI, either by the bloodstream or by ascending urinary infection. The bloodstream infection usually seeps into the kidney, gets into the collecting system, and then shed into the urine. And uh, if left untreated, within a few weeks, the wound would heal and the patient will get rid of the candidia. So this uh, pathophysiology process, less, much like TB, is very well understood and studied. However, the ascending infection in the urinary tract is not that well studied. 
and uh, it's more like uh, biofilm uh, related to catheters and sometimes formation of the um, uh, bizots or the fungal balls into the collecting system where something acts as the nidus where the bacteria grow. So what are the species involved? The most common is the Candida albicans and fortunately this is uh, not only the most common but also very susceptible to fluconazole. Uh, second can be dependent on the type of population. So Candida glabrata is the most common in the elderly and uh, immunosuppressed and oncological patients whereas Candida tropicalis is uh, common in others. Uh, there are others like uh, Paraceliosis and Cruzi also. So what you should remember is that Glabrata is a species which doesn't uh, respond that well to fluconazole apart from uh, this Cruzi. Unlike for bacteria, uh, the pyuria is present in the funguria also. So if you have funguria, pyuria is present, but that doesn't help to differentiate between the colonization and active infection, nor does the colony count. Unlike bacteria, the colony count of a yeast will not tell you whether it's an invasive or non-invasive infection. Also, Candida glabrata grows slowly. So if you keep the culture search for 24 hours, you may miss the growth of these small colonies. Usually they take about 48 hours to grow and 72 hours to characterize properly. So if the uh, petri dish is thrown away in 24 hours as done in most institutions, you're going to miss the growth of yeast. Also, most laboratories for the yeast do not identify the types of uh, uh, species uh, of the yeast isolated. So that would be a problem in the institutional treatment, especially if you have resistant strains. So how do you approach a patient with candiduria? In an asymptomatic patient, we need to repeat the clean cat specimen, make sure that the specimen is clean and uh, the isolate is actually from the urine. Once it is there, then you try to correct the uh, factor, whether it was prolonged antibiotic or presence of a catheter. We need to remove those factors and then again recheck whether the growth of the candida is there. If it still remains positive, then you want to look for factors like obstruction. Uh, if a patient presents with symptomatic infection, either of the lower tract or upper tract, uh, then we need to start appropriate antibiotics, especially check with the back if bacteria are present, treat the bacteremia or bacteriuria. If in spite of that, symptoms do not settle, then we need to do an ultrasound and look for obstruction and other causes. Same thing for the upper tract also. So treatment, asymptomatic bacteria, uh, candiduria should not be treated except in certain high risk population, which I'll discuss later. So antifungal susceptibilities and concentration of antifungal regions in urine is important factor in choosing the fung uh, fungicidal agent and persistence of catheter is likely to, be, uh, uh, likely to prevent the eradication or help in persistence and so does failure to relieve the obstruction. So, Catheters, tubes need to be removed and obstructions need to be drained. So when to treat asymptomatic candiduria in patients? Before you do urological procedures, especially if there is obstruction, collection, drainage required, you need to cover them up. In neutropenic patients, it's likely to go into candidemia. So these patients need to be treated. So are very low grade neonates. This is not very relevant to us. And how do you treat? Usually, we treat by 200 to 400 milligram of fluconazole as the first line of treatment and usually a two-week treatment is adequate even for upper tract UTIs. However, in cases which have invasive serious fungal infection with this thing, you may have to treat with amphotericin 0.5 milligram per kilogram per day or normal cases two weeks with persistent infection, maybe up to a cumulative dose of three grams, which may take about 60 days. We need to treat as urologist complications. So uh, we need to remove the tubes. If there is persistence in bladder, you need to do a video urodynamic, find out what is the cause, look for abscesses, fungal balls, and other uh, things which can be cured. If there is obstruction, some form of diversion, PCN or a DJ stent is required. If there is emphysematous pyelonephritis, papillary necrosis, mostly due to fungus, it requires nephrectomy. Perinephric abscess need drainage, fungal balls could be treated and drained. And if required, sometimes nephrosity with irrigation with amphotericin B can be taken. 
So if you look at the last few years, uh, we had about four cases of uh, uh, fungal UTIs reported. Uh, they're mostly only case reports, isolated mucormycosis in the renal aerograph. It's the most common uh, mucormycosis uh, happening in immunosuppressed. And then uh, there's one isolated case uh, from PGI Chandigarh, which showed the uh, present with mass and pyelonephritic changes and uh, they went into operate could not remove and they treated with antifungal amphotericin b and uh, the whole mass resolved with a small abscess remaining which was not treated any further in the recent days i think it will be unfair if we do not talk about renal leukomycosis during this pandemic uh, so usually uh, uh, localized manifestation of a generalized disease and mostly fatal by the time it involves a kidney. Uh, this is one case report of a renal artery thrombosis due to mycosis, more localized disease, and this patient was saved. So it is a rare disease with mycosis re-emerged during the pandemic. So what we conclude that most patients with candidurea are asymptomatic. There are risk factors of increased age, female sex, antibiotic use, urinary drainage devices, prior surgical procedures, and diabetes mellitus. Treatment is indicated in only patients who are low birth weight infants, patients undergoing urinary tract procedures, and neutropenic patients. Symptomatic urinary tract infection should be treated. Treatment of choice of fluconazole it attains very high concentrations in the urine. Amphotericin B and flucytosin are less desirable. They do not attain very good concentrations in the urine. Other antifungal agents such as voriconazole, posaconazole, and candins cannot be recommended for candidate urinary tract infection because they have very little drug activity in urine. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, all of you. Uh, only thing is, I don't think we have Dr. Ram Gopal Krishnan because he is traveling. So to kickstart a little of the discussion, there were a few uh, questions from the chat. Uh, one is from Dr. Surya Prakash to uh, Ganesh sir. Sir, how long would you give the cranberry? As long as the patient feels happy about it. <laughs> I've got patients on cranberry for years together. Okay. So uh, Yes, sir. Uh, I got a I got a question to Dr. Ganesh, sir. Yes. Sir. See, the apart from the antimicrobials, this uh, cranberry extract, D manos, there are so many combinations are available in the form of capsules and uh, tablets. Is it advisable to give all these combinations? Yeah, actually, the cranberry works good with the D manos, and it's quite safe for diabetics actually also. So it's okay. No, the 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 advantage of this is. It's one of those things, It's you hit it, you miss it sort of situation. It causes no side effect, literally. And all the patients have given it, uh, they don't have, it either works or it doesn't work. They will tell you it's not working, then stop it. Forget it. Those are when it works, it works. They, they swear by it, as I said. So it's nothing wrong in it. It's it's a cost is a problem. It is, it's not cheap, you know. Uh, so the pharma industry now realizes that there is a role for this. And I think the price for this is a little excessive. But certainly the juice is not, not recommended. The juice does not contain any of that stuff. It just contains a lot of glucose and all, all the waste. So don't juice is okay for just one glass if you want it or mix it with something different. Venu sir, you want to comment now or you want to cap the whole session at the end? I think I think I'll make some few comments and finish it off. If no, you if it, if I'm permitted. Please, sir, please go ahead, sir. Uh, I think there are the session was extremely useful for all of us. That first thing I have to say. I think Ram Kamal, uh, his uh, talk was something exemplary. But only question that I have for him is, with all the antimicrobial showing resistance and not useful, not so useful, what is the present trend that is being followed? And especially, I would like to know, what's the cost of this newer antimicrobial that's coming up? We, are they affordable for Indian patients? And if so, what alternatives we have as far as can? Now, Ganesh has come out with a very interesting area which I've been uh, harping on and uh, talking about for, for probably two decades now. And I think the most important thing is 
as far as possible, try to avoid uh, antimicrobials in uncomplicated UTA. I am not saying that complicated UTA can be treated with uh, cranberry or any other medication <laughs> that you have. But definitely, asymptomatic or uh, minimally uncomplicated UTA definitely will benefit by uh, primary juice, as you mentioned. Now, it, uh, I have been using juice as well as uh, tablets, and I have not found much different, though Ganesh says tablets are far better. Maybe he's right. He must have used it in tons, not uh, as much as I used. The most important thing that I would like to emphasize here is he's lamenting on mandalamine, that he was importing it from, uh, I mean, uh, from abroad. It is not so. I think mandalamine was available by main Baxter company in India manufactured in Hyderabad. And unfortunately, it stopped mandalamine stopped because of the cost factor involved in it. There is no cost in that. So no pharmaceutical cost uh, making profit of the mandalamine and hence it was stopped. I think these are old stories. Probably with many of you do not know uh, the past as much as I have gone through in the 50 years of my life in urology. I think the talk of uh, Santosh is also high. I eliminated many aspects that we should look for fungal infection more often than what we are doing today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there is one question from chat box to Dr. Santosh. It is from Dr. Ravindra Sabnis. So the culture is resistant to fluconazole and creatinine is borderline high. What are the choices we have? Thank you, sir. I, uh, my talk, I apologize that I think the volume could have been a little higher. And I thought the organizers, because the recorded talk, they could increase the volume. But uh, I'll answer that question. Uh, fluconazole is the best drug because it's the only drug which is very well excreted in the urine. The doses that could be given was 200, 400 can be increased to 800 in renal failure. And what happens with renal failure is the amount of drug excreted in the urine decreases. So once the excreted drug decreases, increase the dose, it will take care of that. So a lot of time we only uh, communicate with the microbiologists because they are the ones who have done the culture. They isolate the species and they will also tell us the sensitivity. For us, the advantage is that uh, we do have a very good microbiology department. If you don't have a good one, as I said, lab data and all grow very slowly. So you may not pick it up. If you haven't kept this, it's recommended that at least 72 hours, you should keep the Petri dish to report it. So a higher dose of fluconazole 800 will be better than going to the other drugs. You should know amphotericin B and all are hardly excreted in the urine. Other thing is if you give it urinary installation by catheter or by this thing, there is no systemic absorption. So uh, there is a bit of a thing. So fluconazole higher dose probably would be better. Dhani sir, I have a question to you, sir. Do you also recommend estrogen tablets along with the cream? That's number one. Number two, what I would definitely email you for the protocol <laughs> as far as the cream and uh, the thing is concerned. Uh, I don't use the tablet. I use the cream only. And uh, recently at the concluded uh, BM, uh, the BAUS meeting, there was a talk by one of the urologists, uh, the urogynecologist, saying that the tablet seemed to have had better effect than actually the cream. And I beg to disagree with, I beg to disagree with her. And I said that there are women, I use the, the, the cream freely because I think I can, uh, whenever I want to give a drug, I must be sure that I can handle the side effects or I know about the side effects. So the tablet is something that is beyond my, my realm. And so I, I just go with the, with the cream and it's very effective. And you can give them the cycle. So it's, it's okay. There's no problem. Sir, I have a question. Do you advise a pap smear? They all they all have a, a pap smear. In fact, most Before of them have had a pap smear done. And uh, I actually they actually come. They've seen the gynecologists and all the rest of them before they actually come and see us. So that is that is done. And that's a that's an important question that uh, uh, Ganesh has actually asked. Some there's a question here saying that is cranberry juice advisable for diabetics? I don't think the juice should be good because if you look at uh, look at uh, the the contents of that juice, there's a lot of sugar in it. And I don't think the diabetes should take the juice. So you keep the tablet if you want. So there's one more question from Dr. Joseph, sir. Are the vaccines available in India? Not yet. Not to the best of my knowledge, but I'm sure that they'll come. 
Uh, Euromune will will definitely come soon because already the Spanish trial and EAU and all the rest of it, they're only using it there. So it should come. So it's been a really good session. I think we had some eye openers in the whole, uh, uh, all the three talks. Uh, with this, uh, I thank uh, <laughs> Professor uh, P. V. L. Murthy and Professor J. Raman sir. Uh, for being uh, in the session uh, and we close the session now thank you sir prakash the next for the next session thank you sir uh, i thank chairperson sir dr malikarjun reddy sir dr pvl and murthy sir dr jay raman sir for uh, chairing this interesting session i thank all the speakers sir done an excellent job uh, now we move on to the third session the, this session we have three interesting oh. debates <laughs> for this session i invite uh, dr gopi chand a urologist from hyderabad the last session dr sitalingeshwar So we have three debates. So once the debate is over, we have an opinion poll by the audience. After the opinion poll, the, the moderator will give the, his comments. Now I hand over the session to the uh, chairpersons. Thank you, Dr. Gopi. So thank you. Um, good morning to my co-chairperson, Dr. Neely and Dr. Vinod. Uh, the first debate is on acute pyelonephritis to stent or not. We have Dr. Dinesh Ticharian from Kochi and Dr. Vijay Bhaskaredi from Tirupati. I request Dr. Vijay Bhaskaredi to just start the uh, proceedings. At the outset, I would thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Today, I am going to speak first stenting in acute pyelonephritis. I remember the proverb, a stitch in time saves nine. Literally, it means if you sort out a problem immediately, it will save a lot of extra work later. A stent in time saves resources, decreases morbidity, as well as the mortality. You all know the advantages of stenting. For a practicing urologist, there might be no tool more versatile than ureteral stent. I think you all agree with me. Acute pyelonephritis is an acute bacterial infection of renal pelvis and parenchyma. The clinical spectrum may be a simple mild presentation to a florid severe infection like emphysematous pyelonephritis. Whenever you feel there is an obstruction and the imaging shows obstruction, go for decompression of the system. It's an emergency procedure. There is no debate about it. <clears throat> Take a pyelonephritis patient, conservative measures are the first, taught an antibiotics, review after 48 to 72 hours. If he's doing good, good response, continue medication, switch over to the culture sense to antibody. If patient is not improved, good prognostic factors, repeat imaging. If you see even a minimal hydroidronephrosis, intervene. No hydroidronephrosis, it's a gray zone that I will discuss. No hydronephrosis, why to drain the system? There, there are, because there are a few factors like infection per se, lead to decreased or aperistalsis of the ureter and impede drainage. Presence of necrosis papilla, causing obstruction may not be seen on CT. Bacterial toxins acting directly on smooth muscle as well as inflammatory exudates decreasing the peristalsis mechanism. Persistent fever spikes, tachycardia, loin tenderness, turbidity and proteinuria uh, mandates early intervention, shifting or balance towards stenting. Few poor prognostic factors like gross pyuria, high temperature, persistent loin tenderness, high counts, compromised renal function, thrombocytopenia, Elderly age, positive cultures, HbA1c of more than 8%, multiple comorbidities, elevated inflammatory markers, all these suggest a need for early invasive inter urological intervention. The presence of air in the parenchyma or collecting system, minimal hydroidronephrosis on CT is an indication for early disease resolution. Antibiotic resistance is another important factor that tilt our balance towards early intervention because minimal hydronephrosis also cause increase in the pelvic calcium system pressure, compromise renal circulation, decrease uptake of drugs by the kidney. So a prolonged antibiotic use of no use and increase the morbidity as well. Urine cultures, if you take, they're positive in 70 to 75%, blood cultures only 10 to 20%. So the rest of the patients with long-term, uh, with negative cultures need long-term antibiotic usage. Uh, so it increases the lengthy hospital stay, poor quality of life and absence from work. The mortality can be as low as 1.2% to as high as 33%. If it is emphysematous pyelonephrosis, it can increase up to 40 to 60%. If you don't intervene, patient will die. 
So do something that is benefit to the patient rather than wait for antibiotics to do everything for you. I do agree there are a few side effects with stent because uh, stent encrustation usually occurs more than three months and by the time you will remove the stent, UTIs keep on prophylactic antibiotics, frequency urgency and dysuria, other storage LUTs, keep alpha blockers, anti-muscarinics, mal positioning and migration will rarely happen if you place it under guidance properly. Inadequate relief of obstruction, keep a larger lumen stent or a PCN drain the system adequately. Stent fracture is a rare event. Forgotten stents, keep a registry, mobile app reminder, keep them under follow-up and remove. Uh, ideal stent without side effects is at to be engineered. So whatever is available, go with them. There are few health economic aspects of indwelling stents that includes direct cost and indirect cost, but it is a rare for a urologist to consider the financial status of patient before planning a simple, minimally invasive intervention like DJ stenting. To conclude, a high index of clinical suspicion, identification of unfavorable prognostic parameters, and an early intervention like DJ stent are required to achieve a better outcome in acute pyelonephritis. It seems simple infection a dangerous if not promptly treated. So go for early intervention with minimally invasive digestion if you are required. Thank you. Dr. Dinesh, Dr. Dinesh Cherian would speak on not to stent. Very good morning to the organizers and the senior faculty of the ninth ASU, Professor H.S. Butt. Midterm Virtual Workshop 2021. Thank you for giving me the chance to take part in this debate. I would be speaking against the topic, acute pyelonephritis to stent or not. Acute pyelonephritis is acute infection of the renal parenchyma and the renal pelvis due to the ascent of intestinal bacteria from the bladder. It is a tissue invasive disease a clinical diagnosis with a spectrum that ranges from systemic manifestations to no symptoms at all. It is commonly seen in women with an altered immune status, plus or minus an obstruction to their free flow of urine. The pillars of management is aggressive fluid resuscitation, depending upon the functioning of the kidneys, properly selected antimicrobial therapy based on local drug resistance patterns, and source control. Urine becomes sterile in most patients effectively responding to therapy within few hours itself. It is worth noting that a few patients may continue to have flank pain for several more days and they just need to be observed. In situations of clinical worsening, a repeat urine culture is warranted so as to ensure that the most effective antibiotics were selected. In situations of suspected obstruction or complications associated with acute pyelonephritis, an imaging is performed. And please note that an ultrasound is more sensitive than a CT to pick up hydronephrosis. There is just one reason for stenting, and that is obstruction. The acute kidney injury that manifests as a rise in serum creatinine is due to the hemodynamic shift associated with the inflammatory process and they typically resolve within five to seven days. We need to give the body time to recover. The following are evidence-based reasons against stenting. Partial antibiotic effectiveness itself causes clinical cure in 36% of the patients. UTIs are a cause in 30% of the patients, of which acute pyelonephritis itself is about 10 percent. We are aware of stent related symptoms that range from hematuria and urgency to incontinence to forgotten stent. For the advocates of those who say that stent causes effective drainage, we know that thick purulent material will not drain effectively through a stent. There is a risk of anesthesia, there is a cost incurred, and there is a chance of disseminating bacteria from the urinary tract to the bloodstream during manipulation. There are three pertinent questions. How long do we retain a stent? How do we monitor a patient on a stent? And will not the stent cause persistent reflux of infected urine? Wasn't just that the start of the entire process itself. 
there is hard evidence according to the eau which says that a short outpatient antibiotic course of therapy is equivalent to longer durations of therapy that's how effective appropriate selection of antibiotics is remember that childhood acute pyelonephritis is managed with oral or iv antibiotics and there is no mention of double j stenting anywhere in the guidelines there are two triggers that practically influence us to stent and the first of which is the unresponsive admitted patient and that is because of the indiscriminate injudicious and repeated usage of over the counter antibiotics the answer to those patients is not stenting but guidelines based on local antibiograms and culture sensitivity reports the second trigger being bulky kidneys with perinephric stranding remember that that is tissue inflammation to the insult that has occurred how would a stenting help we require antibiotics that effectively penetrate into the renal parenchyma not to stent a patient with acute pyelonephritis is not a dogmatic conclusion i understand that this is a debate but let's just be pragmatic and scientific with our approach stenting is definitely indicated in all patients with pyelonephritis due to obstruction but that is just a minority the majority of patients can be eff effectively managed with appropriately selected antibiotics thank you now we have a audience poll on this debate acute pyelonephritis to stent or not i request all the audience to participate in the debate in the polling i hope you can see the question on your monitor so i request all the audience to put their vote for uh, both dr dinesh and dr vijay baskar the points were very uh, well documented yeah Can we go ahead with the result, Doctor Surya Prakash? Yeah, yeah, they have put the timing. I think you can reduce the timing, Surya Prakash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got it. So, so that's the verdict of the audience. The verdict and points are really well taken. Um, uh, the acute pyelonephritis and nephritis, especially if there is no obstruction, uh, pertinent questions have been put forward by Doctor Dinesh. Uh, which needs to be answered before stenting and even if you are stenting there has to be minimal manipulation definite successful stenting should be done and minimal pushing of the contrast because otherwise uh, it will be counterproductive but there are points by vijay also that uh, timely a uh, decision has to be made there is a window period that we may get and if we miss this window period the uh, the patients may succumb and they may deteriorate and a delayed stenting Uh, would again um, be much more uh, counterproductive. So a decision has to be taken patient by patient in that particular situation, and that is the best thing. I think that is why the poll we see it is a very closely fought poll. Thirty six versus sixty four percent. Thank you, Doctor Sir Prakash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Doctor Vijay and Doctor Dinesh. Excellent debate. Dr. Neeli, can you come on? Hey, Dr. You are muted, Dr. Neeli. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, AS2 and the organizing team, for giving me the opportunity. uh the this debate is on chronic prostatitis
You are not audible. I think his connectivity is a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, yes. I call upon Dr. Vijay Kumar Sharma to speak on antimicrobials for chronic prostates. Dr. Vijay Kumar. Good morning to everybody present. I thank the ASU Council for giving me the chance to speak on this topic, antimicrobials in chronic prostatitis, and I will be debating in favor of antimicrobials. So just uh, let's revisit the classification. This is the NIH classification, and here we are concerned with uh, these two categories: chronic bacterial prostatitis, that is category two, and category three, and that is chronic pelvic pain syndrome, in which the bacteria are not grown. So what is the treatment? So once you grow the bacteria, obviously it is category two, that is chronic bacterial prostatitis, and you have to give antibiotics. There is no doubt about it. The dilemma is in the chronic A bacterial prostatitis, that is category three and three B, which is also classified as CPPS, chronic pelvic pain syndrome. So here also antibiotics are the first choice, especially for treatment naive people. And in the next few slides, I'll argue why antibiotics are the uh, choice and why they should be given. So the thing is that CPPS does probably have an infective etiology. The first and foremost is because the symptoms are similar to any prostatic infection. The patient presents with uh, pelvic pain, with dysuria, and it resembles prostatitis. And then there are some data which I'll go through in brief. This is, is the data by Collins et al. published in Journal of Urology, and uh, here they have mentioned that uh, history of sexually transmitted disease confers a 1.8-fold greater risk. Of getting chronic prostatitis later on in life, and then uh, this was a, a study by Nickel et al. again published in Journal of Urology, where EPS or VB3 showed uh, uropathogenic bacteria in 8% of patients with category 3 prostatitis, and in the remaining patients also some of the other bacteria was grown, which was not uropathogenic, but still there was some growth. So these all things point to a bacterial etiology of chronic prostatitis in category 3 also. And this is a recent study using advanced techniques, a culture independent analysis using uh, polymerase chain reaction techniques by Kurt Nickel et al. Again, uh, Barcholderia sinocypatia was found in uh, chronic pelvic pain syndrome patients. And then this is the uh, litmus test. If CPPS is actually caused by prostatitis, then should it respond? To antibiotics and yes it definitely responds these are all the studies i won't go into much detail except this one this is a meta-analysis published in jama where they concluded that alpha blockers antibiotics or a combination achieve the greatest improvement in clinical symptom scores now coming to the guidelines although aua doesn't discuss any guideline the eau has a strong recommendation of antimicrobial therapy either quinolones or tetracyclines over a minimum of six weeks, especially in treatment naive patients and with a duration of symptoms less than one year. And this is the level of evidence which they found based on which they gave this strong recommendation. And uh, the level of evidence is 1A. So obviously we have enough data in hand to conclude that antimicrobials should be prescribed. So in the end, I'll just like to summarize that in chronic bacterial prostatitis, obviously, the bacteria are grown, so you have to give antibiotics, there is no doubt. And in chronic A bacterial prostatitis, that is chronic pelvic pain syndrome, where the bacteria are not grown, grown, even then antibiotics have to be given. I rest my case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar. I call Dr. Balgopan Nayar to speak on non-antimicrobials in management of chronic prostatitis. Dr. Bab, Bab Good morning, Gopan. everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank ASU for giving this opportunity for being a part of the midterm HSB workshop 2021. I'm supposed to speak on the role of non-antimicrobials in chronic prostatitis. We all know the prostatitis it has been there since ages, was described in 1838, and there have been 
various treatment modalities with prosthetic massage drugs suggested by Posner in 1893. There are also various classification. The current classification that we follow is NIH 1999 in which it has been divided into the five types and the one that we are interested in is the type 3A and B with the inflammatory and non-inflammatory part. We know that prostatitis accounts for about bacteria account for about 5 to 10 percent of the cases and the exclusion criteria for the category 3 is various. The most important being that there should be no demonstration of any euro that is demonstration of uropathogenic bacteria is an exclusion. exclusion. The etiology, the initial insult is an infection and immune response, toxin, trauma or stress in these genetically susceptible patients leading to a neurogenic inflammatory response which is then facilitated and propagated by psychological, immune, neurologic and uh, endocrine mechanism to produce the final outcome and phenotype. Infection has always been labeled as a cause for chronic prostatitis with the STD being the primarily Although the odds are elevated, increased with STD, but no evidence of any active STD disease is seen in these men. And there is no difference in routine culture of men with and without prostatitis. This has been shown by Nichols et al. in 2003 and in which the asymptomatic men appear to routinely have bacteria in the prostate. And by themselves, the bacteria may not produce symptoms or disease. And PCR and one of the uh, thing that is labeled on this that the bacteria the, that the, it's the infection is the inability to culture the organism from urinal tract. Now the culture independent technology with next, next generation sequencing, DNA amplification, etc. They found two organisms to be slightly more prevalent in these patients, but the pain still persists even after the clearance of bacteria. So what are the other etiologies for? chronic prostatitis, inflammation which has been shown with biopsies as well as autopsy studies with increased intraepithelial lymphocytes being there it may be immune or autoimmune in origin then the IgG4 has been found in prostatitis first described in 2006 the autoimmune response is seen in the form of increased lymphoproliferative response to various prostatic antigens and the level of chemokines are also elevated the neurologic etiology is which is the most important. The cardinal symptom in these patients is pain and its central sensitization in afferent and efferent neurons are found and there is a continued nerve activity in the absence of stimulation or requires very low levels of nociceptive stimulation. These men have been found to have decreased connectivity between the motor areas involved in pelvic floor control and the right posterior insula, an area involved in pain processing and sympathetic autonomic control. The greater pain was associated with less connectivity between these areas. The other etiologies being the pelvic floor dysfunction with tenderness striated muscle, poor to absent function in the ability to relax the pelvic floor efficiently which is greatly we can see even in the ultrasound where there is low pelvic mobility in these patients. There are also other etiological factors like so psychosocial, these patients have more of helplessness and catastrophizing than the endocrine abnormalities with alteration of the pituitary hypothalamic axis, greater cortisol rise in, the CP in these patients and lower baseline levels. The etiology, there is abnormal sensory processing. So with this aspect, NIH sponsored the multidisciplinary approach to pelvic pain study and then came the failure of because of this failure of the monotherapies, Shosuke et al. in 2009 suggested this U-point system of, uh, for, for a phenotypic approach to symptoms and symptom clustering, which therapy is directed to specific domains. The U is the urinary, P psychosocial, organ specific infection, neurogenic tenderness, or skeletal muscles, etc. And there is a strong correlation between number of domain and severity of symptoms and largest domain is the organ specific or the urinary and the smallest being infection. So various studies have given credit for antibiotic efficacy. There is a large randomized placebo controlled studies have failed to consistently show any meaningful benefit. Only the NIH sponsored tetracycline with other uh, vitamins have been found to be have some bad infect, uh, bad benefit. So the questions arise, why should they be used at all? The clinical diagnosis require UTI to be excluded. So the proposed factors could be some anti-inflammatory properties in these antibiotics and Meta Shu et al. has shown a random effect model to account for the heterogeneity of studies concluded that antibiotics are not effective. 
So we should provide information which is personalized and responsive to patient problems, conveying the belief and concern in a, is a powerful way to anxiety. And uh, it is speculated that some of these patients profiting from treatment have had some unrecognized uropathogens. The other treatments that have been found to be effective, alpha blockers, IUCD and EAU recommends they use the anti-inflammatory, they are found to be useful in combination with alpha blocker and muscle relaxant. Long-term side effects are there. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors can be used in the elderly. Then medications for neuropathic pain have been found to be useful. Phototherapy, pentosan, polysulfate, PDE5 inhibitors each have their own benefits. Conservative measures definitely should be tried. They have been found like lifestyle changes, stress management, acupuncture, pelvic floor physical therapy, prostate massage, in some soft way they are found to be useful in this multidisciplinary approach for the treatment of prostatitis. So to conclude, there are no positive trials for clinical monotherapy. Start with the most conservative therapy lifestyle and further therapy is multimodal based on patient phenotype viewpoint uh, system. Involve more than one specialist, neuro, gastro, the physical medicine, like in our setup we use the help of this physiatrist they were very helpful in this management particularly they are also they also main manage the pain and so it should be a multimodal approach thank you we have the audience poll on this debate Dr. Neely, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Can we know the result of the poll, Dr. Sir? Yeah, it's going on. I think it's for 30 seconds, we'll get the result. Yeah, that's the verdict of the audience. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar and Bal Gopan Nair. Uh, it was a great uh, talk by both of you to highlight on the role of antimicrobials as well as the holistic approach in treating the patients with uh, uh, chronic prostatitis. So as the poll also suggests, there is no clear-cut evidence to, for the use of uh, antimicrobials as well as there is some role, especially in uh, antimicrobial new patients as well as in those patients who have presented within one year of having this chronic prostatitis, as even the guidelines say. So the mainstay remains to treat the patient's symptoms with a holistic approach using, uh, uh, utilizing other departments in the management of these patients and uh, managing their uh, domain of concern is of primary importance. Thank you. If there are any questions, then can be taken. We will move on to the next debate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, very good morning, uh, respected teachers and uh, my dear friends. Uh, next debate is a very interesting uh, uh, problem during the management of uh, infertility patients. You always see a lot of patients coming up with uh, pyospermia and most of them will come with a culture report. Whether you want to do it or not, you will have to manage a culture report. And when you look at the guidelines, you can, see, including the USA guidelines, you can uh, see uh, a strong argument for culture report for a semen culture in uh, pyospermia. But many of the practitioners are not following that. So uh, we need some help, uh, and I think the debate uh, between Dr. Raghavendra and uh, Dr. Arun will put some throw some light on, into this gray area. And I welcome uh, Dr. Raghavendra to speak for semen cultures in infertility evaluation. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Raghavendra Kosgi. Today I'm going to debate with my friend Dr. Arun on semen culture in the evaluation of male infertility for ES. So coming to the male accessory gland infections, it can be a prostatitis, seminal vesiculitis, or it can be an epididymo 
coming to the various reasons for the male infertility infections account for almost 15 percent of male infertility which is the third most common cause and when compared to western world indian population are having more infections and like genetic reasons and other idiopathic male infertility because these are the potentially treatable causes of male infertility so semen culture is an important diagnostic tool in the evaluation of male infertility so recent WHO manual also clearly mentions the importance of the infections as male genital tract infections or inflammations may cause direct effect on the sperms or it can cause a raised ROIs which is causing oxidative stress and DNA damage or it can alter the male genital tract microenvironment. So the indications for the semen culture, it can be a leukocytospermia or it can be a symptomatic male accessory gland infections. But routinely what happens in the clinical practice, all the lab technicians, whenever they're doing semen analysis, they mention these round cells as a pus cells, because this round cell can be a leukocyte, it can be a macrophage, or it can be a primary spermatocyte, it can be a residual cytoplasm, or it can be a uh, spermatid. So treating spermatids as a primary spermatocyte or residual cytoplasm will not give any results. So proper documentation of infection is very, very important for good outcomes. And what is the role of semen culture in the era of erratic antibiotic use by clinicians as well as quacks and poor compliance from the patients which is causing global health burden of antibiotic resistance specific diagnosis and treatment is very very important and this timely management will uh, halt the genital tract obstructions because of the infections so this asymptomatic leukocytospermia may be an early sign of infection as more patients are seeking ART, it's important to diagnose asymptomatic infections to improve the semen quality and ART outcomes. And also we can prevent spreading silent infections to the partners offspring causing infertility or illness by early detecting them. So always it is better to hit the bug at the early stage for better outcomes. And recent ASRM paper, they're also clearly mentioning where there is asymptomatic men, asymptomatic, they have done semen culture in asymptomatic individuals and surprisingly there is a 20% asymptomatic positive semen cultures and this documented seminal abnormalities with positive semen cultures and documented improvement after the treatments. So that clearly highlights the importance of the semen culture and there is a treatment of, there is a meta-analysis and review, systematic review, which also highlights the importance of the reveals antibiotics may improve sperm parameters, the rate of resolution of leukocytospermia, the bacteriological cure rate, and even the pregnancy rates. Although the data is insufficient, but still there is a some hope towards the usage of the antibiotics for proper, proper diagnosis. And you can see this, there is a case control study where there is an asymptomatic chlamydial infections in 165 healthy and 165 asymptomatic positive patients, which also documents there is a treatment with antibiotics will improve the semen parameters. So what are the guidelines are saying? The recent AUR ASRM guidelines are very clearly mentioning men with increased round cells should be evaluated further to differentiate white blood cells, whether it is a pyospermia or it can be a germ cell. And further, Guideline statement 17 also clearly mentions patients with pyospermia should be evaluated for the presence of infection. So proper evaluation with semen culture is needed. So what is the take home message is semen culture is an important diagnostic tool in the evaluation of subfertile male. So when the patients are having leukocytospermia or symptomatic male accessory gland infections, but available data is insufficient to recommend on a routine basis. So well-designed, good quality studies are needed to emphasize the role of semen culture. So at the end of the day, coming to the semen culture, yes, it is in selected patients with leukocytospermia or symptomatic individuals. Thank you. Thank you, oh, South John, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Surya Prakash, once again, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Raghavinder. At the end uh, of the day, it is a balance to save the patient, whether to use, whether to do, which test, it is a complete balance. Thank you. Thank you, Raghavinder, for that uh, excellent presentation. You have clearly uh, mentioned your points, like uh, if a documented pyospermia is there, you have to do a culture and treat accordingly. Now we will hear from uh, Dr. Arun about the uh, 
uh, about against using semen culture in infertility evaluation over to you arun i thank the aic for giving me this opportunity and this uh, prestigious sort of uh, hs but midterm workshop so uh, we will be debating on the role of semen analysis in uh, sorry semen culture in male fertility evaluation do we do we need to do it on regular basis so questions we need to ask before ordering a lab test is why is test being ordered and what are the consequences of not ordering the test how good is the test in discriminating between the health versus the deceased in this case is the fertile and infertile men and how are the test results interpreted how will the results influence the patient management outcome the common misconception among the physician now is the laboratory test is considered more objective than the patient's history and physical examination the reasons we order a test will be being a diagnosis monitoring screening or research purpose so coming to the guidelines who guidelines currently not have any indication for semen culture the eau guidelines that recommend performing semen culture when there is a positive uh, proxy positive cells about 1 million per ml of ejaculate it is considered to be leukocytopenia however to our current knowledge this recommendation has never been validated so the various guidelines again the diagnostic method in au and asrm is wet mode microscopy with immunohistochemistry yeah you already i mentioned is a wet mode microscopy with proxy positive training now where the semen culture is uh, given as a confirmatory test for leukocytopenia another study in fertility and sterility where they uh, check for semen fluid microorganisms as there any significance or just merely contaminants the research showed microorganism detected in 37% of first catch in sample 27% of mixed human sample and 51% of semen samples these organisms are gram positive organisms they are common to both urine and semen samples there is no correlation between seminal microbes in the raised leukocyte or between leukocytopenia and bacteriospermia and pregnancy to to conclude the microorganisms were found in infrequent quantities in the semen of asymptomatic men the frequent isolation of the gram positive microbes common to both urine and semen and the absence of correlation with the raised leukocyte concentration suggested that bacteriospermia usually represented contamination rather than any significance in evaluation uh in the male fertility when we have round cells in semen we go for orthotelin staining this differentiate between the immature germ cells and the leukocytes in case of leukocytes we can go for semen culture pcr the organisms uh, detected in the culture are usually enterobacteria and gram positive but they are now uh, unlikely to have any effect on the semen parameters but the organisms like lambda uriaplasma mycoplasma which have significant effect on the semen parameters are usually detected with the nat elisa or pcr culture is usually not sensitive in identifying these organisms coming to male accident gland infection there is the criteria has various uh, subdivisions it can be a history physical examination prostate fluid examination in ejaculate sense one among this is the culture showing positive growth so did not be mandatory we have other uh, various parameters in diagnosing male accident infection also the aeu guidelines tells treating male accident infection improve semen quality but does not necessarily improve the probability of increased conception and uh, there is very little data to conclude antibiotics and antioxidant treatment of infertile men with leukocytopenia improving the fertility outcomes limitations of semen culture is because of the proportion of men positive semen culture due to contamination there are various lifestyle factors which could be uh, implicated in increasing semen leukocyte concentration the more accurate methodology for semen leukocyte assessment this with flow cytometry and monoclonal antibodies like again uh, cd45 and cd53 so coming to immunohistochemistry ricky et al uh, proposed a study with the uh, flow cytometric uh, immunological method uh, he compared with the simple proxy test and he found positive correlation so immuno uh, cytology is considered highly specific and recognized as the gold standard for diagnosis of leukocytopenia the drawbacks is the lack of standardization Time consuming to perform manually is relatively expensive if you do with the flow cytometer. Both the ASRM and AUA recommend immunohistochemistry to confirm it diagnosis for leukocytopenia. So to conclude, the incidence of positive semen culture does not consistently uh, same with the fertile and infertile men. The semen quality parameters between men positive and negative for each bacterial species differs between studies. Though the bacteriospermia has no significance in the artificial reproductive technology process, there are new techniques to isolate the sperm from bacteria. so overall there is not seem to be any indication for routine semen culture in case of male fertility evaluation or before ivf or cryopreservation 
However, in symptomatic men, leukocytospermia and positive salmon culture need to be treated for. So, at the end of this, at least now you should agree with me that salmon culture is just not routinely done in male fertility evaluation. Thank you for this opportunity and your kind attention. Uh, now every, everybody should be ready for the audience poll. So, so till the results come, uh, Dr. Thanks, uh, Dr. Agavendar and uh, Dr. Arun for uh, uh, fighting in the debate together rather than fighting against each other. They have uh, brought uh, a different perspective of the same problem. Uh, it's it's uh, well documented that there is uh, leukocytospermia and it is affecting the fertility status of the male. And uh, and uh, okay, the results have come. Uh, most of the most of the audience is going against a routine semen culture. Okay, so it, when, uh, when there is a uh, uh, lot of uh, leukocytospermia, the infertility potential comes down, and you have to treat them definitely but whether to do go for a culture or not is a, a, another question there are uh, there is an element of uh, contamination it may not uh, properly reflect uh, the the true organisms so these issues are there and our scientific knowledge is limited so we need to treat them but whether to follow culture is uh, completely up to the clinician and based on other parameters and uh, uh, you have to discuss the patient accordingly and convince them that uh, uh, blindly following the culture report may not be the answer uh, in the treatment of the patients. And all these antibiotics are harmful to the nature and are harmful for that uh, fertility status of the patient also, that also has to be kept in mind. So thanks uh, uh, Arun and uh, Raghavinder for that excellent uh, discussion and uh, fighting together uh, for a uh, good topic. And thanks ASU for uh, giving me this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Vinod. Um, thank you, doctor. Yeah, we'll come to the end of this th third session. Now, I thank all the uh, speakers who have they made their point very clear in, in all the three debates. And I also thank the chairperson for this session, Dr. Gopishans, Dr. Neely, and Dr. Vinod for making valuable comments. Now, we'll end this session. We move on to the last session, that is the session on host factors in Eurosepsis. Now I invite Dr. Ganesh Kamar sir to, to take over the session. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Suri. Thank you, Dr. Suri Prakash. We come to the last session of today. Uh, close to 25% of all sepsis cases are secondary to a source in the urinary tract. It's a critical problem where the outcome can change either way dramatically in a short time, and it's incumbent on our part to recognize these situations and address them at least the reversible element if present judiciously and fast this final session has two parts the first 30 minutes we have a guest lecture and the second half will be a case-based panel discussion dr ram rajgopalan is an eminent critical care consultant someone who apart from an envious distinguished academic career has this unique ability of simplifying the most complex topic and challenging conventional dogmas after graduating in 1983 from Madras Medical College, he obtained his board certification for after residency in internal medicine from University of Illinois and critical care from University of Pittsburgh. He then took the difficult and bold decision to return to India and established one of the best critical care centers and departments at Sundar Medical Foundation, Chennai. He has since moved to Ramachandra Medical College where he continues to favor his passion to teach. He has been at the forefront of academic medicine and was responsible for establishing fellowship courses in critical care with the National Board. He has been the inspiration for scores of critical care fellows nationally. He became the president of Indian Society of Critical Care and an editorial board member of, this, of their journal. His bibliography is truly inspiring, with an impressive volume of contributions to peer-reviewed journals, original articles, editorials and guidelines, apart from close to 15 book chapters. He will talk on the central role of the host in Eurosepsis. Dr. Ram, the stage is yours.
Good morning. Uh, I'd like to begin this talk by thanking Dr. Ganesh Kamath for having invited me to speak to you. But I realize that as an outsider, somebody who's not a urologist, I may be coming into this talk with a little different perspective, which may be a little surprising to many of you. Uh, as an intensivist, I think as much as I recognize the importance of antibiotics and source control in the management of sepsis, and as you probably have been hearing through many lectures during the course of this meeting, uh, I do believe that there are other factors also that are equally important that predict the outcomes in a given patient with sepsis beyond just the use of appropriate antibiotics and an appropriate surgical or interventional method of controlling the source of infection. And just to emphasize this, I will run through a couple of cases just to say how we as intensivists think a little differently about the management of a patient with sepsis. So if I was to take a very typical case, a 78 year old man with classic features of a urinary tract infection, presents to you with the features, uh, is awake and conscious, uh, he's got a blood pressure of 180 or so systolic, and a heart rate that is elevated, a temperature that is 101, and a white count that is elevated. Under normal conditions, you probably would call this patient as septic, but we need to emphasize that the current definitions of sepsis have changed quite dramatically. These three parameters, which are part of what we call the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, and white count changes, are clearly not good indicators of the development of sepsis. As a consequence, the definitions of sepsis have changed in the recent past, and about six years ago, uh, a new set of criteria called the sepsis three criteria were adopted, where basically they rejected the idea of this SERS criteria, and they emphasize that organ dysfunction is a very important part of identifying an individual with an infection who has progressed on to developing sepsis. And again, along these lines, since organ dysfunction was important, a, an objective score like the uh, sequential organ function assessment scores, the SOFA score, has been made a important part in the assessment of the patient with sepsis or modifications of that just to make it a little easier for most individuals to calculate a SOFA score. The QSOFA has also been developed. Let me just give you another case in which a similar kind of a presentation of a similar kind of an individual here is differentiated by the fact that he is also disoriented and drowsy and has a very high respiratory rate despite a normal oxygenation, implying that there is probably some degree of a metabolic acidosis underlying. The combination of those two is very clearly to me something that will you know, raise the concern that this patient is septic and probably needs to have something done about this. The way in which the host responds seems to be the most relevant aspect of the development of sepsis. And that is something that we probably have underemphasized over the last several years of managing patients in the ICUs. Let me just give you a idea of what the current uh, trends are in terms of the development of sepsis. This is data from the Western world, and probably it is not so uh, clear in, in uh, lower income countries like India, but it probably is very similar. The frequency of sepsis over the last decade or so is progressively increasing. The incidence has gone up quite dramatically in the short period of time. Probably the reasons for this are we have older people right now, maybe we are getting more immunosuppression with medications and drug resistance of the bacteria are probably factors that are accounting for the greater amount of sepsis that we are seeing in patients. But what is more important than this is the trends that we are seeing, at least in the Western world, in terms of the mortality. And uh, even if I take the more conservative kind of uh, value that I'm, I'm, I'm going to take over here, the, uh, the lower one, the ICD code based uh, estimates, the mortality has fallen from about 50% 10 years ago to close to 40% at the present time. Now, all of this will make us believe that this change in mortality is probably something that we did effectively early antibiotics, good source control, and probably the current value of uh, critical care has changed this quite, quite significantly. But we should recognize that as much as this change of 10% is very meaningful, 
there is still a large gap that remains unfulfilled. We have a large amount of mortality, close to 40% of patients in septic shock who ultimately will die. And probably this is very clearly dictated by the heterogeneity of host response. And the host factors probably modify the way in which an individual responds and needs to be given some degree of an attention. So along these lines, the first question that we need to ask is, what are these factors that lead to a difference between individuals who get infected and some of who develop organ dysfunction and some of who progress in their organ dysfunction even to die? And the second concern that we have is what is the consequence of this kind of a heterogeneous response in terms of our current treatments and the way in which we predict our outcomes? And I will try and see if I can address these two during the course of this lecture. To begin with, I think we need to look at the host factors that are responsible for the outcome. And it is not very untraditional for you to find a whole list of varying um, conditions that um, are associated with poor outcomes in patients with sepsis. Some of them are reasonably logical, like age and gender. Age, probably not so much. Okay, The age uh, definitely is a factor that will influence the, the way in which a patient responds to sepsis. And there are several other factors, and this list is constantly growing. As much as these lists are very instructive, they are not clearly explanatory, nor do they carry a primary therapeutic significance. So some attempt to order these lists have come in over the last several decades. The first process is to classify these lists into a structured format, such as the PIRO format, and let me explain what the PIRO format is. We divide the, 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 the uh, uh, underlying risk factors into the first one, which is the P or the predisposition kind of factors, which evaluate the susceptibility of an individual to get an infection. Obviously, an older person is likely to get an infection, probably because of the level of immunosuppression that they may have. Patients with comorbidities can acquire an infection more frequently. Patients with chronic liver disease who have a suppression of the reticular endothelial system can also have a greater predisposition to infections. The second aspect is the infection itself. And here it is the interaction between the patient and the infection that becomes quite important. The, the cause of the infection, the location of the infection, the nature of the infection, particularly MDR infections, are very relevant in causing a heterogeneity in the response of a patient to a specific infection. And ultimately, the response of this patient is also equally important. How do they react physiologically when they have a uh, infection? And the extent to which they react physiologically would be a marker of the, uh, the, uh, the overall uh, response of the individual to the infection itself. And lastly, uh, the extent of the organ dysfunction that they will develop. So the PIRO score, predisposition, infection, response and organ dysfunction is a reasonable way to classify all the host risk factors. And it's probably worthwhile explaining uh, the, um, some of these in some greater detail. The relationship between age and sepsis is reasonably obvious. As the individual grows older, they have a greater tendency to acquire an infection as seen by the yellow lines but they also have an increasing tendency to die because of the infection as shown by the blue line in terms of the mortality. And the reasons are quite uh, you know, simple in the sense that the increasing comorbidity that may be present in an older individual, the suppression of immune responses in the older individual, the associated malnutrition, the tendency to be admitted to a hospital and be using medical devices, all of that increase as you grow older and that can clearly account for the fact that there is a greater level of susceptibility as you age. The second aspect is when we go on to the ideas related to the nature of the infection itself. The first thing that we need to ask ourselves is, yes, infection causes mortality, but is the specific organism a relevant kind of a factor? Because most of our studies, when we talk about sepsis and outcomes in sepsis, we lump all infection together. Maybe broadly, we may divide it into gram negative and gram positives. But does it matter what the specific organism is in terms of the outcome that the patient will have? Or does it matter 
what kind of resistance pattern this particular uh, organism has. And this is a little difficult to completely differentiate because most patients who develop an infection can die because of the infection itself or may die because they were sick enough to develop an infection. So the primary illness can be a cause of the mortality as much as the infection itself. And to differentiate them, you need a little bit of sophisticated statistical um, methodology. And there is data related to this as much as we can see. For instance, organisms, infections with extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing organisms or a resistance pattern such as that is definitely associated with what we would consider an attributable mortality to the infection itself. Likewise, pseudomonas infections are also something that is associated with a greater pro probability of dying. This is quite important for us to re recognize. That is, the interaction between a specific organism and an individual is variable depending on the kind of uh, an organism or uh, the uh, environment in which the patient is. The value of the environment is very obvious when we see the differences between patients who have community acquired infections and ICU acquired infections. It may also be um, related to uh, the uh, fact that the patients in the ICU are sicker. But as I show you, there is an attributable mortality, irrespective of the level of sickness, to the acquisition of a infection in the ICU. Thus, bloodstream infections and ventilator associated pneumonia carry an excess mortality. But strangely enough, the catheter associated infections that you get from a urinary tract infection in the ICU doesn't seem to have an excess mortality. And this may be a little better explained by the next slide, which shows that the site of the infection is equally important in determining the mortality. Over here, there is a list of different conditions with being compared to pneumonia as gold standard. If you look at surgical infections, maybe arising from an ischemic bowel or from a major abdominal catastrophe, the outcomes are generally poor, and this is adjusted mortality for the level of sickness that the patient has at baseline, implying that it is the specific site that is causing a worsening in terms of the mortality. And when you compare that with, say, obstructive urinary tract infections, which have the lowest uh, comparative mortality, it is probably because obstructive urinary tract infection is the one which is most amenable to, to manipulation. You can effectively get good site control with non-invasive or minimally invasive kind of techniques. And probably that in combination with an early access to the uh, nature of the organism allows us to provide much better treatment. But it is very clear that that interaction between the site and uh, the, the uh, ultimate outcome of the patient is very strong. One of the things that we always find very difficult to, to, to discuss in, the, in this situation is the relationship between appropriate timing of an antibiotic and mortality. You are probably told during the entire course of this uh, discussion in the last few lectures that it is extremely important that you time the antibiotic early enough. And here is the famous uh, Anand Kumar paper that showed you a linear increase in mortality with every hour of delay in terms of the treatment that the patient was provided. Well, this is very important for us to recognize, but we should recognize that not only is time an important factor, but it is equally important that the antibiotic that you give to the patient at a given time is ap appropriate. And this is going to be a very difficult kind of a, a situation. Not only does it take time for us to identify a specific site, it is also very concerning that under our conditions where a typical urinary pathogen, as you probably have seen, is probably responsive to very few oral antibiotics or for that matter, most of them require some kind of an advanced antibiotic in terms of um, being effective. And this is further compounded by the fact that we in India have had a special attack with the New, New Delhi metal beta lactamase, which literally renders all of our current antibiotics reasonably ineffective with probably the exception of polymyxin. And this again is a very strong concern because to get a early treatment in, we need to be very clear about the appropriateness of the treatment. And this appropriateness is going to be affected very strongly by the environment that we are working in. And this is again demonstrated in more recent studies 
where in contrast to the yellow line, which is a reflection of the Anand Kumar paper, there is absolutely no difference over time in terms of the delay in administration of antibiotic and the development of a patient mortality. And this again is a reflection of the complexity with which antibiotics and their response to an infection are going to be presented. Additionally, you should also remember that the tendency for us to abuse our antibiotics, to overuse our antibiotics has got its own negative effects. Every time we suspect an infection and we give a patient an antibiotic and ultimately we withdraw it finding that they didn't need it, it is going to be associated with a severe increase in their mortality when they do acquire an infection, probably through mechanisms that mediate increasing resistance. So the entire interaction between an individual and the organism is so variable. Likewise, when we look at the patient's responses to an infection, the way most of our patients in, in uh, sepsis will react will be with a, some degree of a cardiovascular compromise. And this we traditionally associate with an underperfusion of the tissue. And we believe that when there is an underperfusion, that the metabolic processes, particularly of glucose metabolism, identified on the right side of this graph, is impaired. Basically, the lack of oxygen because of a lack of tissue perfusion is going to cause a attenuation of the Krebs cycle, which will result in an accumulation of pyruvate, which will be converted to lactate. And we typically would like to believe that under these circumstances, it is a underperfusion that is responsible for the lactic acidosis. And this can be treatable by aggressive hemodynamic manipulation. Clinical studies have demonstrated that hemodynamic manipulation does not affect the, the lactate levels. And this is because there are other mechanisms in sepsis, and this is uncontrollable. Clearly, another mechanism that we have is when the glucose metabolism itself is accelerated by the catecholamines that are present with increasing levels of sepsis. And under those conditions, while the glycolytic pathway is not normal, it is actually exaggerated, it creates some kind of a traffic jam at the level of the pyruvate, and there is a saturation of the Krebs cycle. And as a consequence, the pyruvate builds up and ultimately converts to lactate, which is not necessarily the same as when you get with a tissue hypoxia. This unfortunately is not manipulatable and is a very strong predictor of the severity of underlying illness. And this we see is extremely variable in most of our patients. We clearly see that values of lactate that are much higher are clearly associated with greater mortality. And not only is it true as far as the lactate level itself is concerned, but the clearance of the lactate or the removal of lactate from the blood is also an independent correlate of survival. The quicker the patient gets rid of the lactate, the better. But neither of this can be manipulated by us. It is very much a host response that is responsible for the amount of lactate that is produced and is a very strong predictor of the way in which the patient will ultimately respond. Similar kind of effects can be seen with other markers of inflammation like procalcitonin. While procalcitonin is not a great marker of the development of an infection, it is an excellent tracker of the way in which the patient's infection is progressing and a lack of improvement of the procalcitonin is strongly associated with poor outcome. Glycemic control is another kind of an issue that occurs in many hosts. And it is very clear that hyperglycemia can occur both in diabetics and in non-diabetics. And we are particularly concerned about hyperglycemia that occurs in the face of sepsis in a non-diabetic individual. This is strongly associated with the marking up uptick of the uh, inflammatory markers that are present and clearly is associated with an increased mortality. And ultimately, when we come to the issue of organ function, the more organ dysfunction that is present, the greater the number of organs and the greater the severity of the involvement of the organ, the poorer the outcome that we see in these patients. For this, we have yeah, developed the SOFA score and the value of the SOFA score lies not only in, in making an initial diagnosis of organ dysfunction and the need to classify the patient as sepsis, but also a progression or an improvement in the SOFA score is a very good indicator of the survival of the patient. So what we see from this entire list of, of uh, underlying factors uh, that are host factors is the fact that the host response in sepsis is extremely heterogeneous 
And this variability in host response can result in very significant differences in terms of the outcomes of this patient. And this has actually raised a very serious concern because we have not been able to identify the heterogeneity adequately. We seem to lump all patients with sepsis into one common category and then provide them with treatments. And when we do such kind of therapeutic manipulations, success in one population with a specific kind of, uh, I mean, underlying uh, risk factors will not be identical to the response in another population. And this is the whole problem, but the whole decade of, of what we thought was developments in critical care has really failed when we try to replicate them. I'll take the three examples that appeal to me the most. Most of us in critical care, besides the fact that we get good control uh, over the site of infection and the, uh, the provision of an antibiotic, we also focus on the hemodynamic support of the patient. The basic principle in the hemodynamic support has always been early aggressive fluid resuscitation up to 30 ml per kg or roughly close to one and a half to two liters of fluid that is given within the first few hours after the admission of the patient. This has been something that has been considered the holy grail of therapy. And in the West, it is something that is strongly propagated. But unfortunately, a clinical trial that was done in, I think in Gambia, uh, very clearly, Zambia, sorry, uh, very clearly was associated not with any a lack of improvement, but with actually a worsening of outcomes. The aggressive volume uh, resuscitation was associated with a worsening of outcomes. Another kind of situation that we dealt with is again, what we consider the treatment of the year in 2001, what we considered as early goal directed therapy. We believe that in shock states, patients with a declining uh, oxygen consumption, uh, I mean, uh, with an oxygen delivery, are likely to extract their oxygen and have venous desaturation, that measuring your mixed venous oxygen saturation would be a good way to titrate resuscitative therapy. And this was initially proven by the famous reverse study in 2001. But by 2015, three other randomized controlled trials were unable to demonstrate the benefit that was so strongly seen in reverse original paper. The next aspect of it, if you look at the very specific therapy in terms of you know, uh, manipulating the inflammatory cascade, we have had close to 100 different drugs that have been tried within, with, with no uh, benefit. But the one that we thought was very effective, the so-called dotricogen alpha, was something that was initiated in 2001, but by 2005, the studies could not replicate the benefit of the initial study. Now, it is very typical for us to look at all these studies and say, oh, maybe there was a little bit of an exaggeration in the initial trials, and maybe there were you know, systematic problems between the, uh, the study design that caused differences in these outcomes. But one thing that we have never paid attention to is the heterogeneity of the underlying sample could have accounted for this. One group of patients might have been more amenable to therapy in, in one of the studies, and another group of patients with less amenability are probably included in subsequent studies. And as a consequence, we do not see a difference. And the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is what is the biological basis of this kind of heterogeneous host response? And I think we are getting the inkling of what it really is at the present time. The data has been emerging at least in the, this millennium effectively to suggest that genetic polymorphisms or variations in your basic genetic structure are responsible for both the changes in susceptibility of an individual to an infection and their response to a given infection. As you see from this, a whole list of different um, ways in which an individual can respond has been elucidated. The most remarkable example that I see is a reasonably recent paper that came in a, in a group of patients who were uh, admitted to the hospital for a uh, community-acquired pneumonia and who were on the face of it very similar uh, to each other. But these authors were able to identify that there were subgroups of patients with a clear immunosuppressive kind of a pattern, what they called as a sepsis response signature that was characterized by either an immunosuppression or an adequate enough immune response. They called them SRS1 and SRS2, which they could easily identify by looking at seven predictive gene sets 
So the genetic typing could pre-identify these patients from their peripheral leukocytes, and they could clearly identify that the differences in outcome between these two subgroups, the ones with an immunosuppressed kind of a gene set and the ones with an adequate immunoimmune response, was clearly different, strongly implying that there is a genetic predisposition that causes a major variation. Unfortunately, we are not in a situation where we can apply this on a routine basis for our clinical management. So we need to look at other ways in which we can at least try to define more or less homogeneous populations so that we can test our uh, hypotheses in future studies. And the two methods that have been used are probably, um, you know, two ends of a spectrum in terms of their sophistication. The first one has been studies that come, say, from Portugal, which have attempted to refine the pyro uh, methodology, where uh, the, uh, the components of the pyro um, uh, classification have been looked independently in a large derivation cohort of about a thousand patients to see if any specific pattern of this pyro, uh, of this pyro uh, um, methodology can identify groups which have varying levels of uh, you know, mortality. And they were able to identify that. Unfortunately, their validation was in a very small group of about 180 patients. But even this shows you that they can use the pyro method as some kind of a staging of, uh, of, uh, of sepsis, very similar to what you do in cancer staging, where you can have varying degrees of, of severity. And maybe if we ultimately design therapies that will be effective in certain subsets, we probably can extrapolate it to other subsets which will fit a similar definition. The only problem with this is it deals with what we are we know as factors that are associated with an inflammation. There can be a large number of unknown factors. And this is not necessarily always an exhaustive list as the pyro conditions can change over a period of time, different factors can be included and probably it will be something that will change over a period of time. So this is not necessarily the greatest solution, but it is one way of trying to get homogeneous subgroups. For me, what is far more fascinating and definitely far more confounding because I understand very little of it, is the new idea related to artificial intelligence in terms of subsetting these patients. And as I show, when you read these papers, you wonder whether they are talking to you in English or in a different language. And I have to confess that in contrast to artificial intelligence, I run with a natural stupidity and find it a little difficult to interpret these papers. But irrespective, this particular paper is extremely fascinating. They used a what they call an unsupervised deep learning technique, where they just fed in 29 variables that were obtained on the patient at the time of their admission. And they didn't teach the machine anything. They basically allowed the machine to make a judgment about the association between these variables and ultimately in terms of the outcome. And this machine learning was able to identify clinical uh, phenotypes, what they call alpha to delta, which had variations in their basic presentation, which are not very logically normal, but basically some of them with very few abnormalities, low organ dysfunction fell into the group called the alpha phenotype, which is associated with the best survival. And in contrast to that, there is a group with high lactate levels, liver dysfunction and hypotension that fall into the delta phenotypes. Okay, so you can say, okay, so what? We find a lot of differences between individuals and therefore there's going to be a big difference between these varying groups. But what was very fascinating is it clearly, these, uh, these processes, allowed you to make a differentiation in terms of the short-term survival. Here, they looked only at in-hospital survival between these varying sub subgroups, between the alpha and delta phenotypes. And probably far more important, it provided us with also a mechanistic explanation. It was very clear that in each one of these, when we looked at varying uh, cytokine levels into looking 6, 10, and TNF, between the varying subtypes, alpha to gamma, and these are four different studies, okay, or four different uh, populations. But basically, you would see that there is a huge amount of variability in the way in which the, uh, the, the cytokines are produced uh, between the varying subtypes. And this sort of raises the concern that these subtypes are probably reflective of the kind of genomic differences that you see because they're associated with a variation in the cytokine production. 
Additionally, to me, the last and probably the most difficult to, to completely understand was this issue. They looked at the study that was the early goal-directed therapy study, much earlier done, which showed no benefit. The majority of patients had a neutral benefit from the early goal-directed therapy and a few had harm. And when they looked at the, the phenotypes as derived in this alpha, beta, gamma, and delta in a retrospective fashion on the data that was available from this study, they saw a specific pattern in which the alpha was a little bit on the prominent side, but the number of patients with the delta phenotype was almost non-existent. And what they did was they subjected these patients to a, a simulation in which they changed the constituents of the uh, subtype that was present, or the mix of the population was changed progressively. In one, they changed the alpha phenotype progressively. In the other one, they changed the delta phenotype progressively. And they could clearly show that there was a major difference in terms of the outcome. By changing the alpha phenotype, they had more benefit. By changing the delta phenotype, they had more harm in these patients. And what they were trying to show very clearly is what we thought was a homogeneous population can actually probably be a mix of two minutes of, uh, of both a, a patients with an alpha phenotype and a delta phenotype. And as a consequence, if we want to use this in the future, we need to be able to subtype these patients a little bit more. This kind of a process of attempting to refine the, the nature of the underlying characteristics of the patient are probably extremely important for us to make uh, treatment differences in the future. As I suggested, we have a large mortality gap in sepsis that needs to be resolved. The current therapies in terms of antibiotics, early support, uh, draining a specific surgical site and providing basic critical care is probably not uh, more than adequate. We need better methodologies and it looks like the genomic typing or the artificial intelligence programs seem to be a much better way of providing us with some degree of precision care. And this, I hope, will be the way in which we can bring our mortality down from the 40% or so that we see down to even a reasonable 20 or 30%. And it will make a very big difference in terms of the outcomes of our patients. The traditional uh, argument about sepsis is sepsis has always been delayed in terms of its detection and delayed in terms of its treatment. And I believe that yeah, as much as we have made a lot of progress in both of these areas, I think we need to recognize that our inability to differentiate the different subsets, subsets of patients with, with sepsis are probably something that we have under-recognized and we probably need to focus our attention on over the next decade or so. I thank you very much for giving me this time. I hope that this was not too esoteric. If not, at least it brought you an idea of how people in different specialities think about what we think is essentially the same problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ram, for that superb discourse. It has been our good fortune to listen to you and hopefully assimilate some of the contemporary thoughts that you mentioned on the theme. I invite you to join our panel of experts in the case discussions which will follow now. Thank you. Thanks. We have come to the last session of our uh, Eurosepsis workshop and now we have a panel discussion. We have three case vignettes which we encounter not rarely in clinical practice. In each of these, we hope to pick some relevant points and aspects that will hone our judgment and decision making in recognizing and preventing imminent sepsis or reversing critical sepsis where possible. A few words in the format adopted today. Each case will be presented by a presenter and I'll be engaging the discussions through a few questions based on the case. Our panel of experts will be invited to offer their perspective at the end of each case discussion. We'll also have an audience poll on debatable issues on each case. The audience can participate by posting their comment or question in the chat box. I welcome our discussants, Dr. Chandramon from Hyderabad, Dr. Joseph Philipraj from Puducherry, and Dr. Manish Sinha from Bangalore. Our presenters are Dr. Datta Prasad from Hyderabad, and Dr. Bharat N. from Chennai. Our panel of experts, Dr. Kesha Murthy from Bangalore, Dr. Vasudevan from Tiruvananthapuram, and our guest speaker, Dr. Ram Rajgopalan. will be giving expert comments at the end of each case discussion or at the end of the session. 
May I now invite Dr. Datta Prasad to present the first case on post-op urosepsis. Dr. Datta. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. We are discussing case on post-op sepsis. 50-year-old lady presented to urology OPD with complaints of left loin pain of two weeks duration. Pain was colicky in nature, associated with vomiting. No urinary other uh, complaints, no history of fever, not a known diabetic or hypertensive, no other comorbidities. On clinical examination, it was un unremarkable. Investigations showed complete urine examination, three to four pastels per high power field, no bacteria, bacteria, and CBP hemoglobin, hemoglobin 12 gram per cent. Total leukocyte count 8,900 per cubic mm, and uh, RFT showed serum creatinine of 1 milligram per cent. An ultrasound, right kidney normal in size and echogenicity, left kidney which showed mild hydronephrosis. On plain CT KUB, Left upper urethric stone was visualized about 8 mm in size, hound field unit of 1100. This CT picture showing left upper urethric calculi of size 8 mm with mild hydronephrosis. She was planned for left URSL by RRS, intraoperative antibiotic prophylaxis with injection sulfurosum plus sulvactam 1.5 gram IV given at the time of induction. Cystoscopy, bladder was normal and left semi-rigid URS done with 6 by 7.5 French URS passed into the left upper ureter up to the stone. Stone was migrated up to into the lower calyx with irrigation by the assistant. RRS was planned. 9 by 11.5 French access sheet could be passed only into the left ureter till the ischial spine. Plexx to URS is passed and scope passed into the PCS. Stone was relocated from lower calyx into the upper calyx with nitinol basket. Vision was hazy. Laser lithotripsy done with holmium yag laser with energy settings of 0.4 joules with 15 hertz frequency. Irrigation with handheld 50 cc syringe operated by the assistant. As the laser lithotripsy was going on and the stone was nearly fragmented, the calyx ruptured and few stone fragments migrate into the rent. Procedure was abandoned and digestant placed. This is the intraoperative video showing initially Semi-rigid ureteroscopy was done with 6 by 7.5 French ureteroscope. Stone is seen in upper ureter. <clears throat> While fragmenting the stone, the stone passed into the PCS with the assistant irrigation and stone was relocated from lower calyx to upper calyx. RIRS was done with flexx to URS. While the stone was fragmented nearly and the calyx was ruptured and the stone fragments are lost into the rent and procedure was abandoned, digest and placed. Postoperatively, on day one, patient had fever with 1 or 2 degree foreign heat with tachycardia of pulse rate 120 beats per minute. BP is normal, 110 by 70 mm of Hg, saturation is normal, with WBC counts raised to 18,000. And urine blood culture sent on day one and started on meropenum, 1 gram stat followed by 500 mg IV TID. On day two, fever episodes reduced. She was hemodynamically stable and WBC counts reduced to 16,000. On day three, she was febrile, discharged on paroletral catheter. Urine and blood cultures showed no growth. WBC counts reduced to 9,000. Catheter removed on fifth postoperative day. On ultrasound after four weeks showed left kidney DJ in situ, normal in size, and no calculi and no hydronephrosis. DJ removed under local anesthesia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Datta, for the crisp presentation. Now I have a few questions for Dr. Chandramohan who is the discussant for this case. Do you routinely do pre-op urine cultures before upper tract interventions? Yes or no? And a rational, please. Sir, uh, come on, sir. first of all, I thank ASU for giving this opportunity to discuss on post-operative urosepsis. This question answer, first question you asked is, do you do routine urine culture? Answer is yes. Lot of literature support that if the urine culture is positive, there will be sepsis. And if the infective complications are more, if the urine culture is positive. EAU guidelines say it's strong recommendation to obtain a urine culture or you note carefully or perform urine microscopy before any treatment is planned. In this case, it was done. It is three to five. And now AUA guidelines says on the bottom line, you see clinicians are required to obtain urine analysis must, but if the patient has clinical or laboratory signs of infection, urine culture is must, grade 3 evidence. 
So my opinion, uncomplicated cases, you may get away with routine microscopy, but for all practical purposes, better to have urine culture available with you before going to the uh, surgery. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chandramon. Now, if the pre-op urine culture were to be negative and you have covered the intervention with standard prophylactic antibiotic, can a patient still develop post-op sepsis? Uh, sir, uh, uh, I say yes. Why? Because many times uh, stone contains also bacteria and stone culture and urine culture are different. Not only that, in this case stone was obstructing in the upper ureter. So urine might be not coming down properly with the bacteria down. That clearly International Urology Nephrology Journal from Luca Sindelo says that uh, uh, th th this is possible and uh, Indian paper from Kandar Parik also says that stone analysis have better predictive value than urine culture. Yes, yeah, but uh, stone analysis is always uh, prospective, it happens after the surgery. Yes sir, unfortunately we cannot do that. So what, uh, what it ultimately means is that during fragmentation of a stone, it can disperse bacteria within the system. Yes sir. Okay. My next question. Dr. Chandramohan, what are the steps you take during upper tract surgery to prevent post-op sepsis? Sir, uh, uh, ureteric access sheet for reduction of the intrapelvic pressure is essential. In this case, it is used, but in the lower end, it was present. Definitely, when the access sheet is used, water flow will be better. And it is proved by Alberto Breda, who is a very senior in this RIR surgery. In current opinion journal, he has mentioned and also gravity dependent fluid irrigation. You don't flush with 50 ml syringe, or outflow from the access sheath you observe. So absorption of the irrigation fluid, fluid versus whatever the fluid that is coming outside is also very important, which is published in Springer Plus General. And minimize the operative duration. Whenever you have problem, don't cross the duration. So General of Endoirology 2021 recent by Neem Bujani et al says that more than one hour, one and a half hour duration, it is not good for the patient. These three factors are very important. Access sheath, water coming out, pressure and minimal operative, minimize operative, operative duration. But uh, Datta told uh, that he has stopped. In this case, he has taken all those precautions. He has made fragments before that it ruptured and he has put on stent and come out. So probably anybody might have done the same. Okay, thank you Chandraman. What, uh, what is important here is the fulcrum of the entire episode is reduction of intrapelvic pressure. That is what is key in upper tract surgery. Okay. Now, th thank you Chandraman. Coming to the final question, uh, you do a lot of upper tract surgery. Do you routinely explain the risk of such adverse events and outcomes in your informed consent for upper tract procedures? Sir, again, that is an important uh, question. Incidence of such complications is less than 1%. So, if you see here, after doing more than 5,000 cases, uh, as it is less than 1%, I do not explain ventilatory support and ICU care to the patient. I only explain that there is a chance of fever and sepsis, which has to be taken care appropriately. That can happen in uh, 1 to 5% of the patient's fever and severe sepsis around 1%. But I don't explain going into the ventilatory support, ICU and mortality range of uh, complication will happen. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chandramo. So we finished the first case. Now we Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Now this is an audience poll. We would like you to take, uh, this is a picture of uh, pre-PCNL RGC where you have a purulent efflux in the catheter. So there are three responses. Would you like to abandon the procedure, take a culture sample, place a stent and postpone the procedure or C, proceed with definitive procedure with additional antibiotic coverage. Kindly submit your response. Dr. Vasudevan. This is the audience poll. So most of us would agree with this line of treatment. Uh, the action taken is if you notice that there is a significant purulent discharge, 
although turbidity in the efflux does not equate to an infection however it is wise to take a precaution by placing a stent treating the sample and then coming back your comments dr vasudevan uh, definitely placing a stent uh, and postponing the procedure for a later date would be the appropriate response the patient is already uh, in a state of inflammation and in a reduced immune response state so risking the procedure at this moment wouldn't really be to his good advantage so and uh, the patient would naturally be in a much better state by the time we revisit him so i definitely would go by this uh, audience poll any comments on the use of cefepirazine sulbactam as a prophylactic antibiotic any of you yes routinely i think we use that and uh, um, the rec the recommendation would be a single shot where possible and where there is definite signs of a little more thing we would continue that in a post operative period uh, single shot would be the order of the day though i am aware many centers may be doing this without antibiotics also we use routinely uh, cefepirazine sulfat any comments by any of the other experts could i yeah ram uh, just uh, one issue that i wanted to uh, raise was uh, after that initial uh, response after the patient had a complication procedurally there was a period when he had when she had a fever and i think there was an over reaction to that situation uh, there was a migration to meropenem which probably was not indicated so my definition of sepsis today the existence of fever uh, white count by itself is not a definition of sepsis and i think there was a little bit of an over uh, reaction you would have drawn the cultures probably waited it out and as was seen the patient responded within another day just just one more way of responsibility for the medication yeah and the cultures came negative as well yeah yeah okay okay thank you uh, thank you all the panelists and uh, we'll move to the next case now come to case number 2 which is urosepsis in pregnancy and this will be presented by dr bharat and discussed by dr joseph philipraj i hand over to dr bharat good afternoon today's case is on urosepsis in pregnancy uh, we have a 25 year old female who is a primary gravida referred from the obstetrics and gynecology department to the urology opd the patient presented in the 36 weeks of pregnancy with right sided abdominal pain The patient is a known case of a right-sided double moiety with an obstructed upper moiety due to an urethroceal, for which the patient underwent an incision of the urethroceal two years back, and the patient has been asymptomatic till now. The patient has been on regular antenatal visits. She is a known case of gestational diabetes, detected in the twentieth week and on diet control, and was later converted to insulin from the twenty-fourth week. On examination, the patient is febrile with a temperature of one hundred one degrees Fahrenheit. on periabdominal examination the patient had a 36 sized weak size urethrus and the patient had right loin pain and hypochondrial tenderness the patient had an urine output of 2 liters the total counts are 13730 and they ha she had a serum creatinine of 0.71 an ultrasound was done which showed that the right kidney was enlarged with a size of 13 cross 5 cm the patient had a thin wall dilated collecting system in the upper moiety which measured 11 cross 9 cm with extensive debris this is the ultrasound image of the patient showing the right kidney with a dilated upper moiety containing extensive debris the left kidney is normal the patient was advised urine culture and admission she was initiated on injection cefepirazine sulbactam and also administered two doses of injection betamethasone 12 mg the patient was symptomatically managed on day 3 the culture report came and it showed a e coli which is sensitive to cefepirazine sulbactam which the patient is already on it after an initial response the pain and the fever spikes persisted even after 5 days of antibiotics and hence on day 6 the patient was counseled regarding the need for urgent intervention which is either dj stenting or percutaneous nephrostomy so the patient was taken up in a supine position and flexible cystoscopy was done but the right urethric orifice could not be identified hence under ultrasound guidance and local anesthesia 
a right percutaneous nephrostomy was done using a eight French pigtail catheter. This image shows the frank pus that was drained. 550 ml of pus was drained from the patient through the right PCN. The output continued to be purulent for two days, following which clear urine started draining. The output continued to be around 700 to 800 ml through the PCN tube. The patient defoversed and became pain free post procedure. On the sixth day following PCN drainage, the patient delivered a healthy baby by spontaneous labor, and the patient was discharged on the 10th day with the PCN inside tube. The patient came for follow-up to the OPD with no complaints. And at the third week post-discharge, the patient is advised to repeat culture from the PCN tube and is advised to do a DTPA to see the functioning of the upper moiety and to plan further management. Thank you. Thank you, Bharat. Thank you, sir. Now, I have a few questions for uh, Dr. Joseph. Dr. Joseph Philip Raj, if this patient were to be referred to you from the OBGYN department in the first trimester without any symptoms, what would you do and why? Good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank the ASU Council for giving me this opportunity to speak on during the Professor H.S. but midterm ASU workshop. Now, the concerns regarding this patient is she's a primary and it's in first trimester and asymptomatic. So ideally, I would like to do urine routine and microscopic examination, looking for pus cells specifically and presence of bacteria. If bacteria is present and significant pus cells are there, I would like to do urine culture sensitivity pattern also assess the baseline renal function, and then repeat the ultrasound examination to see, confirm the findings, or to see if there is any progress in the size of the kidney. So this will be, the, will be my line of management if the patient is referred in the first trimester. Okay, that sounds reasonable, Dr. Joseph, thank you. Okay, now uh, what would be your recommendations for a primary in the third trimester undergoing an emergency urological intervention, such as this patient did, regarding a choice of antibiotic. Now, the choice of antibiotic will be depending on the local antibiotic protocol and the culture pattern. Now, ideally, if there is bacteriuria and patient is asymptomatic, there will it has to be treated by drugs like nitrofurantine 100 milligrams orally twice daily for five to seven days or amoxicillin 500 mg orally three times a day for five to seven days or cephalexin 500 mg orally four times daily for seven days and recently phosphomycin has come into the picture and three gram orally as a single dose with three ounces of water amoxicillin unless the culture report is specifically sensitivity uh, is shown, amoxicillin should not be given. So these are all the antibiotics which can be given safely during the pregnancy. Now, uh, this is a question pertaining to the third trimester. Uh, so in the event that you're planning a procedure, yeah. what will be your choice of Pre-procedure prophylaxis. Yeah. Pre-procedure prophylaxis will be, it will be, you know, a gram-negative coverage as well as anaerobic coverage should be given specifically. And if the previous culture reports have shown that it is the organism which is, has been grown and now it is the same culture pattern is seen, then the same antibiotic should be given. At least before the intervention, an hour before intervention should be given and then followed up at least two days post-operatively with the IV antibiotics. Any particular Even antibiotic you would like to avoid in this, uh, just two weeks before the delivery, expected date of delivery? Fluoroquinolones should be avoided at any cost. Then, the depending on the trimester, like sulfamethasoxol is contraindicated in third trimester because of the possibility of 
carnictirus. And so this antibiotic safest will be best is nitrofurantoin and amoxicillin and cephalexin. So these antibiotics are safest. Fluoroquinolone should not be used until it is the benefits outweigh the risk, then only it can be utilized. Yeah, a safe bet would be a second generation cephalosporin. Cephalosporin, yeah. It, right through the pregnancy, you can use it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Joseph Philip Raj. Thank you, Dr. Bharat as well. We have an audience poll now. If this patient were to be seen by you in the first trimester without any symptoms, would you consider A, watchful waiting till symptoms develop, B, stenting bar PCN, or C, stenting bar PCN and chemoprophylaxis throughout the pregnancy? Kindly submit your response. Dr. Keshav, yeah, Ganesh. would uh, invite you for expert comments till we get the response. Yeah, one comment after what Philip has presented is nitroferentoin when you're using, you should make sure that the patient does not have a G6PD deficiency. That's one thing which you have to be careful. And cephalosporin is the best bet than a nitroferentoin, uh, according to me. And uh, I think with your poll is showing that Watchful waiting is the best one, which everybody probably would have done that. And unless the patient has some infection, but this patient I would have looked for in the ultrasound if she had dilatation of the collecting system because she had undergone a urotrol seal incision prior two years back before she became pregnant. So if the incision had caused a reflux, that was the reason for dilatation of that. They could have been much more careful uh, regarding the prophylaxis, if required, they could have been on prophylaxis. Okay, thank you. We will now move to the next uh, case. We now come to the final case, which uh, we see quite often, acute pyelonephritis and the urosepsis, which ensues. I invite my discussant, Dr. Manish Sena, to join me. Thank you. Uh, this is a 67-year-old male who came to the emergency room on the 25th of July at 10 p.m. with complaints of anuria, fever and pain, suprapubic region of one day's duration. He was a known case of hypertension of diabetes. He had a past history of acute pyelonephritis in May 2021, city proven with elevated post word residuals, which was treated in the local hospital. Prior to this episode, he had a UTI two weeks back, which was treated with nitrofurantoin at another hospital. On examination in the emergency room, the patient was febrile temperature of 102. He was hypertensive, systolic BP was 90, respiratory rate was 24. Abdominal examination was soft, distended, Patient was catheterized and 350 ml of clear urine was drained. The Q so far score was 2. Patient was admitted with a working diagnosis of urosepsis, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. Investigations revealed a respiratory alkalosis with metabolic acidosis. Sugars were elevated, 335. Bun and creatinine were also elevated. Total count was 12,140 with predominance of polymorphs. Platelets was 1 lakh and a procalcitonin was 72. The urine routine showed plenty of WBCs, RBCs, bacteria and pus clumps. Blood and urine cultures were sent. A COVID PCR test was negative. Dr. Manish, you are the consultant on call in your hospital and you see this patient in the emergency room. What would be your line of management and would you admit the patient under your primary care? Um, thank you, sir. Thank you for having me here. Uh, before I answer the questions, I would like to state that all these comments are based on uh, the guidelines published uh, by the uh, Critical Care Society. Um, and uh, answering your first question, 
what would be my line of management as a surgeon i would be primarily concerned with two questions when do i need to give an antibiotic which antibiotic so the when is as soon as possible ideally within one hour which antibiotic would be uh, two gram negative coverages now it depends on your local hospital uh, antibiotic profile but what i would use is cefepirazone sulbactam with an aminoglycoside now very important that the current guidelines say that these beta lactams should be given as an iv infusion so that is a change next question that i need to answer is does this patient need drainage so one form of drainage has already been done a catheter has been put 350 ml of urine has been drained if there is hydronephrosis i would tend to be aggressive and put in a stent unless the patient shows uh, clinical improvement and absolutely yes this should be managed by a urologist of course in conjunction with intensivists and nephrologists in this case thank you manish so the patient was admitted in the icu under a the intensivist and started on iv fluids insulin antibiotic as mentioned cefepirazone sulbactam was initiated he was on vasopressors and initially bipap ventilation was started followed by intubation and the patient did not respond satisfactorily ct scan done on the, uh, on 29th showed a right sided pyelonephritis with mild hydronephrosis possibly due to a sloughed papilla left pyelonephritis nephritis thicken bladder wall and a nodular liver with portal hypertension and ascites patient was referred to the urology department on the 30th the reason for referral was continuing fever bilateral pyelonephritis with the right mild hun a deterioration of general condition and the need for ventilatory support with elevated peep on examination in the icu the patient was found to be in the prone position so the abdomen could not be examined the bun creatinine and the total counts were shown to be declining since admission the urine output was clear and it was about 60 ml per hour we advised continued supportive and conservative treatment but underlined the need for serial observation and imaging and a need for diversion if required dr manish when would you consider intervention in such a patient and what are the parameters valid or useful in serial follow up during conservative management of such a patient so uh, so i would say that the referral has been sent very late with due respect to the team taking care of the patient and the surgical source of infection in this case either the bladder or the right kidney should have been taken care of within the first 6 to 12 hours so in this case we have put in a catheter we have drained the bladder but the right kidney has not yet been taken care of and the ideal time for that is 6 to 12 hours how would i uh, monitor this patient i would do a total counts i would follow his creatinine i would follow his platelets what and of course the clinical parameters uh, ensuring that he is coming down on inotropic support his fluid support is adequate what is also recommended is uh, lactate levels but i do not think most of us um, have the wherewithal to uh, bear the costs of lactate monitoring so essentially you are looking at uh, whether the acidosis is getting corrected because of sepsis yes sir the metabolic uh, yes, acidosis sir. should also get corrected yes sir okay. okay in this patient who was in prone position what problems did you anticipate during serial uh, follow up uh, so uh, in a prone position the only problem that i anticipate is that uh, palpating this patient's uh, abdomen will be an issue other than that if you look at the fact that we need to mainly look at the um, kidneys and whether we need to intervene then it is easy you you are doing an ultrasound is easy and if you have to put in a percutaneous nephrostomy even that is easy having said that a prone position is not a 24 hour cycle it is done either 16 8 cycle or it is done as 12 hours and 12 hours so in the window that we have we can always go and intervene 
also in in uh, discussion with our uh, intensivists uh, what they have said is that you can very easily take the patient to ot put him on supine bring him back and put him back on prone so prone position should not be too much of a problem okay now the the reason why i asked this question was uh, very often when you have to do an imaging and shift the patient out it becomes a huge problem shifting out a patient on multiple support yes so uh, i would agree with that sir sending for imaging is difficult yeah uh, the patient was continued on conservative treatment and a second review was done on 31st patient was now in the supine position he was febrile temperature was still around 100 abdomen there was no guarding the external genitalia were normal foley's was in place draining clear urine of 2 and 1/2 liters per day we advise repeat imaging in view of persistent fever to rule out any obstruction or abscess repeat imaging the ct scan on 1st of august showed that the right kidney was bulky periuretric fat standing was there the hydronephrosis was less there is only a prominence of the pcs the left kidney there is perinephric fat standing thickened bladder wall with perivesical fat standing and some liver signs were there with bilateral pleural effusion and subpleural atelectasis a third uro review was done two days later there were no new abdominal signs the adequate uh, urine ad- output was adequate there was a decreased need for life support and the ct imaging did not show any definite obstruction or emphysematous changes or any localized collection or renal abscess and there were improving lab parameters as shown in this chart you can see that the creatinine is coming down the total counts are coming down the fever alone is still around 100 we advise to continue conservative management the patient improved over the next few days came off pressure and ventilatory support became afebrile and was shifted to the floors after a two week stay in the icu So, Doctor Manish, what are the surgical options you would like to consider if the patient does not show signs of significant recovery? And would you ever consider nephrectomy as source control in this patient if he were to deteriorate? Yes, sir. So, um, I would agree that, uh, like the team has done, that I would search for uh, another source of infection. uh specifically for an abscess perinephric or even in the prostate so a ct imaging would help there now for the surgical interventions that i would do in this patient suppose he had not improved the first step would be place a stent i am assuming the patient is giving us time for all this the second step would be if the stenting has not helped sometimes what we have seen is take out the stent place a percutaneous nephrostomy and they improve the third step would be to look for perinephric abscesses and there may be more than one percutaneous drains that may need to be put the next step that i would do is an open debridement if i find a lot of pus around the kidney as the last step yes i would agree with the need for nephrectomy having said that the mortality in these patients is as much as 20% oh, no. and we should not take it lightly uh so yes i would agree that if the patient is not improving you need to do a nephrectomy but that nephrectomy has to be done within 5 days if you delay beyond 7 days then the mortality rate goes up so i would also like to go back to your first question on should a urologist manage this patient now we come to why a urologist should manage this patient in this patient overall we have only drained the bladder the source of infection is a bladder outlet obstruction most likely so this is where the role of a urologist is very important in preventing further episodes of sepsis so i would evaluate the bladder outlet in this patient and if i find bph i would operate okay thank you dr manish thank so, you sir thank you very much so this is uh, the actual current recommendations from eau 2021 guidelines uh, for urosepsis and they these are very strong recommendations very strong ratings perform a quick sofa score to identify patients with potential sepsis take a urine culture and two sets of blood culture before starting antimicrobial treatment administer parenteral high dose broad broad spectrum antimicrobials within the first hour 
after clinical assumption of sepsis, adapt initial empiric antimicrobial therapy on the basis of culture results, initiate source control including removal of foreign bodies, decompression of obstruction and drainage of abscesses in the urinary tract. Provide immediate adequate life support measures. So these are uh, the take home messages. Thank you all for participating in this panel discussion of Eurosepsis. Thank you. We now, uh, now have an audience poll. Would you like to treat this patient under your care as a primary consultant or prefer a medical colleague such as an intensivist to take care? We have two responses. I will admit and manage this patient. I will prefer an intensivist to manage. These as primary care. Okay, uh, Ram, I just wanted to ask you a question till the response we get. Uh, on the seventh day, this patient had continuing fever despite being on uh, culture-specific antibiotic. Yeah. And the CT did not show any specific uh, localizing signs. Yeah. So what would you be yeah. your thoughts along on those yeah. lines? Yeah, I have two very strong comments to make on that. Uh, we select culture-specific antibiotics like we select food on a menu. We basically look through a list and see what is sensitive and what is not sensitive. And then we decide to pick on something that appeals to us. And that was the wrong thing in this very particular case. This patient, as you saw with the Q so far in the beginning, presented with sepsis and a clear cut urinary tract source. The commonest organism that we see with a urinary tract source today is an extended spectrum beta lactamase gram negative organism. And for that sake, if you want to do a urine culture initially, or at least a urine gram stain to see if you're missing a gram positive enterococcus, it may be worthwhile. But on the presumption that this patient had a gram negative, the selection of ceftarazone sulbactam, even if there is an in vitro sensitivity is wrong. And I wanted to emphasize that even in the previous case, where that patient had clear-cut bacteremia, fever, chills, rigors associated with the urinary tract infection. And this patient is frankly septic. Under both of these conditions, the current evidence is strong to suggest that a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor is highly inadequate despite its in vitro sensitivity. And that is the point I wanted to raise. I would have probably used a carbapenem in both this patient and the previous one. It took five days to recover. And in this particular situation, that may be one of the reasons. The second thing again was, uh, and this is the need that you need to have an intensivist rather than a urologist alone. Urologist is necessary, but an intensivist can give you a little weight in the fact that this patient actually had, and I don't know why it was not mentioned with any greater detail, the repeat CT showed you a hyper, I mean, hypodense, extremely variable lesion in the liver. To me, that is a liver abscess unless otherwise proven. The guy got better, maybe because your antibiotic was also susceptible. But I wanted to raise that as another concern over here. This patient was non-responding for two reasons. One, it was not that the urinary infection was inadequately handled. It was appropriately handled, but the antibiotic was inadequate. And probably there was a second site for this particular patient who went through this process of requiring you know, I mean, a prone ventilation and everything else, which may have been something that we could have given a little bit more attention to. Thank you, Ram. Any other thoughts from any of the other experts? So as far as the poll is concerned, yeah, there is uh, most would favor that uh, it should be managed by intensivist. Thank you. Of, but these kind of cases always, it's a team approach. Absolutely. And you should know when the person, when the urologist should be called in to see this patient. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that uh, brings us in uh, to the end of the session. I would like to thank all the panelists and my experts and Dr. Ram. Thank you for thank sparing you. the time on, the, on a Sunday. Now I hand it over back to Suri Prakash. Thank you, sir. Do you have any Q&A in this session? Question and answers? There are, uh, there's one uh, question by, uh, by you have, you have posted yeah. a question. I have two questions. Can you, yeah. Can you pose it to Dr. Ram? 
it was an excellent talk. First of all, I would like to congratulate you. We have learned so many things. Uh, one of my question is, we often see Intel starting low dose noradrenaline infusion, even the yeah. people hundred one ten. So, what is your take on? No, there is no indication for uh, quote unquote prophylactic use of uh, noradrenaline in patients who are not hypotensive. Uh, our recommendation is almost always initially attempt to give fluid resuscitation to correct the blood pressure if there is hypotension and subsequently use vasopressors, but there is no role for routinely using it. It does not improve your cardiac function and it does not translate into outcome differences. So we strongly recommend that the adverse effects of the, uh, of the noradrenaline will outweigh any kind of benefit that it may have. We won't use it. Thank you, sir. So my second... Go ahead. Go ahead. Second question is, we all know that nutrition is very important in, in these patients. So when do you advise parental nutrition in these patients? Even though the bowel function is good, they may not be able to take adequately orally. Yeah, almost never is parental nutrition required. On, on an average, most of these patients can be fed enterally. If they're not able to take it by mouth, we can certainly consider placing as simple as a nasogastric tube. If there is intolerance, particularly you may expect with some patients with pyelonephritis to have some intolerance, we can place it more distally into the gut. But our choice is almost always enteral nutrition. There is absolutely no indication for parental nutrition in these patients. Thank yeah, you. Dr. Joseph? Yeah. Uh, sir, thank you for your wonderful lecture. I want to know the, the immune response either the lack of it or exaggerated immune response is harmful to the patient. Now, what are the factors which dictate this response either way? And why does it happen? As I, as I was suggesting very, very clearly, uh, the genetic mechanism seems to be the strong interplay. As I showed you in that one particular study where they identified that SRS1 and SRS2, one was an immunosuppressed pattern, another was a normal immune, immune response pattern. Okay, there was a difference in outcome. Unfortunately, we don't have any clinical way of making that differentiation as it stands right now. Most of these patients will have a quite a wide uh, heterogeneity and you will not be able to identify a specific pattern of who will respond and who won't. And that is a very serious concern. That is the reasons why either genetic typing, if it becomes very popular, or this artificial intelligence option that was provided seems to be a great option. Right now, I think all of us will be resistant saying, oh, it's all expensive kind of options. But uh, if you remember at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic, we all said RT-PCR was impossible to do. And today, everybody talks about RT-PCR in their dreams. And that is basically what we need to understand, that the, the methodology can become something that will become ingrained in us if we are going to make a difference in terms of outcome. And we are reaching an end point in terms of our antibiotic use itself. We're coming to the point where resistance is so high that it is going to be very difficult for us to manipulate or get better outcomes uh, in the future. And I think uh, this is the issue. We don't have a, a lab test or a, 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 or a simple test for us to give us those differences. And we need one. There's no question about it. Sorry for the negative answer. That, uh, are there any surrogate markers which indicate this type of response, either in an exaggerated or suppressed response? Or is there any uh, surrogate marker which says the genetic predisposition regarding this sepsis reaction? No, oh, that's, that's exactly what I was saying. None of these simple clinical parameters would give you an adequate enough uh, marker, nor would the, the blood tests by themselves. But you can use a blood test to say whether there is a response or not. It doesn't necessarily classify an individual into one category or another. Okay, but basically, if you see somebody's procalcitonin was elevated and remains high, and it doesn't come down within a, a, a reasonable period of time, it raises a concern that he is somebody who is not responding appropriately, but that can be multiple reasons. It could be because inappropriate therapy is also initiated. It could be because the site is not drained. It could be because the patient is demonstrating an inflammatory response that is inappropriate. It is very difficult to use this to make that differentiation. And that is where our frustration lies, okay, despite yeah. uh, all other aspects of what we provide. I think the future is going to lie in what is uh, personalized medical care in sepsis. Yeah, Vasudevan, you had a, a final question. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Dr. Ram Rajagobaran, for this yeah. uh, wonderful lecture. My question to you would be, there are a lot of new perspectives now coming with uh, many of the serious COVID patients, as that is, uh, who had a recent COVID infection coming in for ICU care. So what are your perspectives on such patients? I, I'm not able to completely grasp uh, what, what the implications are from COVID care too. No, some patients we get who had a severe COVID infection, especially yeah. severe respiratory involvement or yes. severe cardiac involvement or even severe cardio this uh, coagulation issues. So what yeah. are your perspectives on these patients? Are you talking from a urological standpoint or a general standpoint? Yes, urological point. Some of us, some of them, after having a recent severe COVID infection, comes to us for urologic care. Okay. okay. So, as an intensivist, what would be your uh, perspectives on these patients? Really, nothing different. Yeah. Once they have recovered from their primary COVID infection, they are very susceptible to every other problem in a routine kind of a basis. The usual confusion that always occurs is when somebody comes in with a respiratory infection. To me, that is the most difficult thing. I don't know whether it is the old COVID or whether it is a current infection that is manifesting. And that is usually the points where we worry a lot. But there are ways even out of that. We can certainly look at our antibody levels. We can get some kind of an impression about whether it is an active infection or not. Certainly can, can work with that. But from a perspective of other infections, uh, with the exception of uh, the thing that we had with our quote-unquote black fungus. Uh, we've not really, with mucor alone, uh, with the exception of that, I have not seen any dramatic differences in most of these individuals. Is there an increased risk of thrombosis of uh, uh, you know, cardiovascular events? We don't know for sure. Uh, do we need to prophylax them on a long-term basis? Not very clearly. So a lot of this information is probably in the works. But in general, we don't treat them very differently. And today, if I'm seeing anybody, they've either had a vaccination or they've had COVID, frankly. Uh, virtually, the majority of my patients are going to be like that. And I think uh, we don't treat them any differently. We take care of their primary problem and leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ram. And thank you, all the experts and the panelists. And now, hand it over to Dr. Surya Prakash to conduct the valedictory. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we have come to the end of the session. I thank all the speakers and chairpersons uh, who have participated in this uh, ninth uh, ASU Professor HS Bet uh, workshop, midterm workshop. Now the, it is the time for valedictory function. Now I invite uh, Dr. N. Malikarjun Reddy, President ASU, to preside over the valedictory function. Malikarjun Reddy, sir. Yeah, thank you, Sir Prakash. It was uh, a lot of things have. Uh, been learned and then a lot of things have been uh, clarified. Things have been uh, with the practices which we have been doing, certain things which were not right. I think it's time that we mend our ways. Okay. So uh, I invite comments uh, from the floor. Anybody can want to speak? Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, I think this uh, this uh, virtual meeting is uh, very productive and very useful, not only consultant urologists, but students at large. And the lectures, guest lectures are very good. And also the, finally, the, uh, the, the case material and discussion went on very well. Even the point counterpoint debate also is very good. So I congratulate uh, Dr. Ganesh Kamath, as well as Surya Prakash, for their good work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else would like to comment? President ASU, can I make a comment? Yeah, yes. please go ahead. Please. It was a wonderful webinar, but I want you to do it physically. It would have been wonderful if it was a physical conference with a lot of interaction. This was a wonderful topic, and I thought it would have been more interactive if it was a physical one. Absolutely agree with you. Thank you, sir. But uh, there was a lot of uh, discussions at that time uh, when we wanted to do this uh, uh, CME. And then uh, after a lot of deliberation and then uh, with the question, the double sword of COVID hanging over the head, it was decided that it will go online. And I'm, I was also pretty sure that the time which we have taken, the half day, is actually not sufficient to really uh, discuss the whole gamut of UTI. 
we just leave the pediatric aside, even in the adult segment, you still lot more to discuss. So I think we can have one more, uh, probably the next uh, uh, Professor HSB's uh, uh, CME still can continue on this and then maybe we will complete the UTI then. Yeah, Dr. Keshav, we were contemplating this, but we had such a short time. See, this uh, whole thing was yeah, decided, decided in, done it in Bangalore. You no, know, we had decided in August that the ASU is going to host it. We were normally, HSB, you get at least six months to organize. We had only two and a half months. Anyway, that's a lesson for us, but I think overall we have had a very satisfactory outcome of this meeting. Oh, yes. Anyway, the other issue was also that actually we are the only zone we have we, we have done the their annual meeting online because all the other zones are able to do it uh, physical. So at times matter and then uh, time zones have made those differences. Uh, can I request the secretary? I think Suri Suri would be the secretary at that time next year. I just be I want the dates to put on to my calendar of USI so that it does not clash with anything else. Sure, sir. Sure. It's the uh, the closest Sunday to November 19th. It's already decided. 20th, and, I think. It would be 20th. Yeah, 20th. It's, it's going to be in Trichy. Unless there is an unforeseen event. Nothing will happen, Ganesh. Don't worry. <laughs> we'll definitely do it a physical meeting, sir, this time. Good physical meeting. So, sorry, you can mark November 20th is the next Sunday of, after 19th. Yes, sir. So yes. It will be the next uh, HS part will be November 20th. Yes, yes. With the theme we'll discuss and we'll let you know, sir. Topic. Yeah. Chengal, would you like to say something? Uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. It's really a wonderful conference. In fact, when uh, initially we thought about urinary tract infections, uh, we were thinking that uh, where's the topic was touched any number of times. But every time we go and touch the topic, you get so many things coming out. In fact, the debates were all fantastic. And the, most of the discussions, I think uh, people were up to the point and up to the time. And the discussions were very fruitful. I think everybody enjoyed this program. And uh, real thanks to Dr. Ganesh Kamal, sir, Dr. Surya Prakash, who were the people who were leading the main show. We were all behind. So thank you very much for organizing a wonderful show for us, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank there you. is no uh, discussion between me and Surya because uh, we had our uh, Sogas midterm also on uh, UTI. So both of us were a little skeptical and he was also, should we do it again? But I think we all went ahead and said, yes, this is a topic which is not, uh, which looks very easy on the face and which is uh, very difficult actually to comprehend and treat. Yeah. Surya, you were saying something. Sorry, I didn't. No, no, no sir. That, that, we, any comment from Dr. Ganesh Gopal Krishnan, sir, if he's there? I think he is with Manish Sinha. Okay, okay. Then Ganesh, can I make a comment? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. Actually, the, the wonderful thing as was said by Kesha was uh, the time schedules were uh, tight, tightly adhered to. And at sharp one, we finished our last debate. So that is something which is very good. Very good. And often it happens in online thing also. There is much delay. So as for the content, I think everybody has talked about it. You got in a good number of experts outside our field, which has actually added a lot of value to it. And we got a lot of new perspectives. And many of this had also put in a lot of new information. So actually, all in all, a Sunday well spent. Thank, congrats to both of you and to be KSUT. Yeah, Dr. Malikarjan Reddy, can I say something? Please, sir. Sure. Uh, I think this is uh, really worked out well, planned and executed. Even to the, uh, you know, event organizers, it is a big kudos to them because they have taken quite a lot of trouble in informing, getting the things, rehearsal, and even uh, trial run yesterday. I think the event organizers needs a big, uh, you know, applause for their wonderful work so that it, the time was kept, recordings were absolutely good without any audio visual hitches. I think it's a well organized thing, topic, and it was quite beneficial for a Sunday morning. Topic is well chosen. 
Thank well, you. Sir. Thank you, sir. I think uh, a lot of appreciation, appreciation goes to Srial Technologies, Sneha yeah. and Saitya. They were really on this. They took it to the heart and uh, every minute they were uh, res responding immediately and they did an excellent job. Uh, I, Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes, yes, I completely, yes, completely support that. When a video at 11 o'clock in the night, they were up and about, uh, and then they were absolutely the same uh, uh, cordial voice which comes back, not that at least tired or irritated voice. <laughs> so, uh, and then this was the second time I think we are interacting with them, and both the times mm. I think we have been extremely happy, and uh, they have worked uh, really hard, and their hard work is showing uh, how things go on. Thank you both of you for doing a very good job. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank and you. without the cooperation of everybody, I think it wouldn't have been possible. So I would say it's all in all a team effort from both the ends, from Srial and the ASU. And we are looking forward to more of working together. And uh, it's, we are very glad that this is the third time that we are all working together. And we're looking forward to more. And we also really enjoyed all the content, though we don't understand it completely. But yeah, we are getting uh, some knowledge out of it. We, we as real uh, Sneha and uh, you, I think I we guess. hope we don't have more virtual webinars. <laughs> 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 we are trying to become physical now. <laughs> yeah, you can be physical, but leverage the advantages of being knowledge. digital. Yeah. yeah, you're right. But you can take your help for the technology part. Yes, yes. yes. Definitely. Thank you very much and all the best. Yeah, thank you. So, Malikarjan Reddy, sir, concluding remarks. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, all in all, I think we had a good session. And uh, one thing I would like to thank each and every speaker who has kept to the point. And I think I would also uh, thank Surya Prakash again because he has actually looked at each speaker's content and made sure that uh, there is no overlap. Otherwise, we would have had been listening to the same thing again and again in many of these uh, lectures. And uh, 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 Ganesh Kamath, sir, for his uh, very... Uh, all the time when he, he is looking at perfection, so which I think uh, makes things much more uh, good in the society. So, uh, Chengal, to be always uh, smiling and then... Uh, a good uh, hello when he, he says uh, with a smile. Um, uh, all in all, I thank everyone, uh, the seniors who had actually pitched in. I would have loved to see more people on the uh, who would have logged in. Uh, as Dr. Ganesh sir put up in the uh, uh, council this thing. But I think the trend is not still uh, with the basics of urology. The trend is only with the techniques of urology. That's what I personally feel. If this theme would have been on uh, probably laparoscopy, RIRS, or a PCR, we would have had probably much more. Yes. But I think as a society, we are actually doing something which is far more important to the society, that we get these basics right so that we have a much better society to live in. And with these remarks, I would uh, thank everyone uh, all one uh, one and again one uh, again and then to be on this centennial year a lot of all of us we are uh, privileged to be uh, in this particular uh, era and thank you and then we uh, say goodbye to all of you thank you thank you, thank you. goodbye goodbye everybody thank you thank you sir thank you everybody